Good evening. Welcome to uh, the Northampton City Council meeting of uh, March 5th, 2015. Uh, I'm City Council President Bill Dwight and I am presiding. We will, before we convene and determine a quorum here, which looks pretty good, um, we uh, open up the floor to public comment where anyone and everyone is invited to come speak, uh, keeping their remarks under three minutes. Um, I, and when you when uh, when I call your name based on the sign up, uh, come up, state your name and address, state your business, and recognize that we do not respond. We're not by our rules. We are not allowed to respond because we have a bully pulpit. So we get to talk until everyone dies of old age. You unfortunately just have the three minutes, but I think it's for the best ultimately. But the, it, it, so it's your time. And you are not limited by subject. You can speak on any topic, stuff that we're addressing today or not. Your pleasure. And with that caveat, I uh, will invite Jasper Lapienski up first. <coughs> Thanks for the salute. It was with the wrong oh, regardless. <coughs> so uh, my name is Jasper Lapienski. I live at Village Hill, and uh, I wanted to address what. I personally addressed um, last week there was a lot of snow at the bus stop at the Academy of Music. I think probably most of the people in this room don't take the bus a lot and were not bothered by it. I found it slightly irritating and then slightly more irritating as time went on and eventually I decided to do something about it. So as some of you may know, I started the process myself. I put in two and a half hours of my own labor. Um, mostly to prove a point, but it did make a difference in the intervening week. Um, after I used that to raise the issue, um, the Department of Public Works did something about it. So it, quite quickly, I would add. And I was impressed, and I think that uh, the fact that they are responsive and the fact that the mayor's office was involved speaks to um, the ability of citizens in Northampton to make a difference with this government and with this council. And I think, um, and I'm speaking to the cameras a little bit at this point, this is not something that every community has, and we should take advantage of it collectively. I have done so. I think probably any citizen could do something like that if they wanted to. Um, I'm going to move from that. Uh, you're going to rate me in the, in the B range tonight, Ryan. That's OK. Um, but I want to move from that to, to say that I have not read the materials pertaining to the uh, several ordinances regarding bicycles and sidewalks that are on tonight. In case I'm not able to stay to the end of the meeting, I just want to urge you to have a thoughtful conversation that includes um, the sort of forward thinking that I've been encouraging over the last couple of years and not just simply how do we address right here, right now. Um, specifically, continuing to require homeowners to uh, shovel the sidewalks they abut is not effective because a lot of homeowners don't actually live in the houses that they own in Northampton. And so they have no reason to care. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Bankin. Hello. <clears throat> my name is Sarah Banker. I live at 136 Hinckley Street. This is my first public comment at City Council. And I came out because um, actually about the snow removal ordinance, I just wanted to express my support um, for the amendment um, that you're going to be looking at tonight. And the reason is because I understand that shoveling sidewalks um, as a homeowner can be really burdensome. However, I think the trade-off is well worth it. And the reason for that is because I feel really strongly that um, everyone in our community should be able to get around by foot if they need to. And a lot of people, that's their only form of transportation. And so if you have a whole stretch of sidewalk and most people are shoveling and then there's one person who doesn't, it effectively makes the entire sidewalk you know, impassable. 
And so the, having the ability through, as I understand, DPW or the police department to issue a citation, I think um, begins to kind of put us on par with what's been going on with the, uh, the snow removal policy and, or the snow emergency policy vis-a-vis -vis, um, cars in terms of, you know, if it's a snow emergency, you have to put your car in the driveway. And I remember a couple of years ago when that began to be enforced and um, my housemate's car got towed and we learned very quickly that that's what was going on. And it was frustrating at first, but then we got used to it. And in the end, I thought it, it really makes sense because our cars don't get you know covered in snow now. So I think the same can be true for this ordinance. I think you know there might be some pushback at first, but I think in the long term, it's something um, our community really needs to work towards in terms of being fully accessible for everyone, particularly school children and elders. And in the last minute, I'll just cite PVPC, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission conducted a focus group with elders in Northampton and surrounding towns about a year ago. And snow just came up overwhelmingly as, as barriers to activity for elders in our community. And just to cite a couple things, snow clearing on sidewalks is inconsistent. The in enforcement of snow clearing where it is required is a huge it is a huge issue and so those were like two of the top concerns that elders in our community brought up so I just wanted to make sure that I represented that viewpoint as well so there's been some good data collection efforts um, and because I'm running out of time I also want to say very quickly that um, I urge you to support the bike and ped amendments tonight too because as a biker that's why I live here really and I love more bike parking we can't have more of it in this community <laughs> so thank you Thank you very much. Uh, Bud, you're up. Uh, thank you first for your service. I mean, I, I would never want to come in here and sit through these endless amount of hours that you all do. And uh, I appreciate the public service. So thank you. I'm here to uh, also speak on the, the new ordinance for snow and sidewalks. Uh, this came up during I'm going to interrupt uh, just a second but just so you could you identify yourself and with your address for the oh, record I'm sorry my name is Bud Stockwell 240 Audubon Road in Leeds Massachusetts I'm also uh, the chair chairman of the downtown business committee for the Chamber of Commerce um, and this issue about the sidewalks of uh, just as I think was Sarah spoke so eloquently about uh, the need for safe passage and having things be safe. Uh, a lot of business owners in town feel exactly the same way. And, <coughs> but when we looked at the old ordinance, we saw a lot of problems with it. Um, and I think the ordinance that is being presented here tonight is great. It still doesn't talk about where the snow is supposed to go in downtown. Uh, it says full width of the sidewalk and there's really if you can't put it on the street, where are you going to put it? So, but the the changes that I do see, I wholeheartedly support. I love the change of being able to have uh, parking officials, uh, the parking enforcement officers, being able to um, levy the fines, not they're civil. I'm, I just really am going to state my support for it. The only thing that came up at the last downtown business committee meeting was that. Uh, 8 o'clock seemed onerous, and we feel like 9.30 would probably be a better time to have the, the fines begin, you know, where you would be not in compliance. So, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> M, you're up. Again, uh, my name is Emily Wickenbury and I own one Amber Lane. I was here at the last city council meeting and my partner and I just wanted to thank all of you for your support and make sure that we came out and actually said that in person. It was really encouraging to hear all of your feedback during and after the meeting. 
And we also got a lot of feedback from the community after the city council meeting. There was a news story in the Gazette and a lot of people heard about it. People kind of stopped by the property or reached out to us and it was really nice to hear from property owners in the area as well as local business owners and residents. So <clears throat> I have a couple of letters here that I thought you guys might like to hear that I got as kind of formal support for the parklet. So the first one is from Andy Adams who owns 183 Main Street which has Adams Jewelry and also houses Haymarket and they're our neighbors and he says the proposed parklet behind my building sounds like a great idea and can only enhance the downtown Northampton experience. Sincerely, Andy Adams. And his neighbor, uh, the owner of Haymarket Cafe, Peter Simpson, is someone that we're working really closely with, my partner Fitzpatrick and I, to kind of find ways to enliven the Amber Lane stretch, which would include the development of this community parklet. And he says, I would like to give support to the idea of a small parklet at the bottom of Amber Lane. I would encourage this project to move forward and in fact expand it to include other spaces on Main Street or anywhere else in the downtown area where people are motivated to do so. Any involvement by local residents to give back to the city in this way should be applauded. In any way that the Haymarket could be of assistance in this endeavor, we would be grateful to be included. When I was shown pictures of these projects in the San Francisco area, I was really intrigued. If somehow we could model this movement to bring more public spaces to Northampton, I think it could have a lasting positive impact on the future of our town. I hope this project at Amber Lane can be an inspiring first step. So I felt like that was a really encouraging thing that you know we got as a formal letter from him. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I know our little triangle is just you know 150 square feet. It's very small, but I think that we have a lot of really big ideas, and I hope that it can be an encouraging first step for the community to develop more of these. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all we have signed up. Is anyone else <laughs> interested in speaking at this time? I have an email. Okay. All right. This is this is a comment um uh, an email comment that was probably it was the intent was to present it during public comment i guess uh um dum -dum -dum. this is from tess poe at um beehive sewing um the change from 8 a.m to 9 30 a.m swings too far uh towards business interests and ignores the spirit of the current ordinance and this is relative to the sidewalk again uh the sidewalk clearing which is the safety of those who walk either by choice or by necessity on public sidewalks <coughs> during inclement weather. I understand the challenges uh, building owners must face to maintain their properties during the winter months, but sacrificing the safety and comfort of pedestrians seems like the wrong solution to those challenges. And our central business district sidewalks should not look inaccessible to those who live, work, or visit. <coughs> so, anyone else wish to speak at this time? Thank you. I'm going to ask the secretary to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor White. Here. Councilor Carney. Here. Councilor Levar. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Sheriff. Here. Councilor Here. Here. We have a quorum. In fact, everybody's in their place. And yeah, my chair's falling apart. I'm sorry. Watching your stomach. So if I should just disappear. At any point during the meeting, just <laughs> resume the chairs collapse under my significant weight, gravity. Um, so uh, we have no public hearing scheduled for this, but I will announce a public hearing that, um, and this is by order of the City Council, public hearing will be held on Thursday, April 2nd, 2014 at 7.05 here in the Council Chambers in accordance with the City Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7. Finance and Fiscal Procedures, Section 7-5. This is the Capital Improvement Program, and this is a public hearing for that. The City Council will consider the Capital Improvement Program for uh, FY 2016 to FY 20 of 2020. Councilor Adams. Do we know the approximate length of the agenda without that? Uh, Council Murphy? I don't mean the finance agenda. I mean the City Council agenda. For that? For that meeting. For that meeting? That night, that will be in finance that the t t t is 
Well, here's what I'm getting at. If it's a long agenda meeting, that might agenda meeting that might not agenda that might that might not be the time to do it. You, you would like to consider possibly one of the Tuesday finance committee meetings. I mean, I mean, possibly, but I just it, I don't know if we can know at this point how long the city council agenda would right. otherwise be. But sometimes things tend to pile up, and to add something of that magnitude on top of it might make it an extremely long meeting. Um, in so far as uh, let's see, we have uh, well the announcement of that public hearing. <laughs> there's actually clock start ticking, but. Um, would the finance committee consider convening on one of your regular Tuesday schedules instead to have a separate meeting dedicated <clears throat> to the discussion? I mean, uh, that, that, that's hearing. perfectly fine. And I think there's some timing on some of these issues to get them. And the mayor might be able to chime in on this. But there's, when I talk to Susan, there's timing on some of these financial orders that we've got to get done. Well, it's <clears throat> not. Um, if, do you want me to address that issue? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, you're, the you're, program you're, itself. Um, is uh, obviously there's a deadline set by the charter. Um, we were going to have an issue, um, and this happened last year as well, where there are a few projects that are on the capital improvement program that we actually want to bring forward um, sooner um, because we have a bonding deadline of June, um, and we uh, to to roll some. Uh, bands into a larger bond that we want to include these in um, and so it's this is actually similar last year when I presented the plan you may recall that the new parking system for the garage was part of the plan or part of the program um, but we wanted to get that that purchased and installed we didn't want to wait till after July 1st so we actually brought forward an order almost parallel to the program um, and it's actually our intent to do that for a few projects that are in this um, program uh, so that we can get under that bonding window um, in May, hopefully, um, because the interest rates are so favorable right now. We want to make sure we get them included in the bond. <coughs> so anyway, so anyway, I, I, we were going to introduce them um, on April 2nd, actually, to run sort of parallel with the program. But that, but if you were to hold it on a different date, that would be fine too. So, uh, I just wanted you to be aware of that. Okay, so it's, it, I'm hearing that it'd be okay if we do it later. But when is your next um, Tuesday finance committee meeting? Um, we have one at the that's set up for the end of April now for the that's audit, not to the municipal <clears throat> audit. But we certainly could use the one at the end of this month, or you know, we we can set so that if you meeting did it whenever. The one at the end of this month, it would still be well within the 14 days, correct? Yeah, have notification. Okay. Um, that would be the tw uh, the twenty fourth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Council of Bark. That's what I was going to say. Yes. March twenty fourth. Alternately, finance could call a special meeting. Uh, can meet. or a hearing of the purposes on the seventh or any time previous to that, as long as it's within the fourteen day window. But it'd be good to make a date if we're going to announce to the folks when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm fine with the twenty fourth. Well, twenty fourth is fine because the the audit was moved off till April, so the twenty fourth is a free date. You're the last Tuesday of the month. Yes, or, or the third Tuesday, which third. sometimes is the last and fourth. It's a Tuesday. Oh, twenty fourth. So the twenty fourth is a day, and because yes, the audit was moved, that day's available. We we've, we've established the twenty fourth is a day. <laughs> what would the time be? David, what's the time? It has to be published in the newspaper. So if you, we'll uh, wrestle Dan Crowley to the ground to make sure that that happens. And they, um, <laughs> so it would Dad the ad would have to go in like tomorrow. 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 Meaning literally published tomorrow? Uh, or? No. Okay. Just has to be submitted. They have a five days, a five day window. So okay. They they also have deadlines too that I'm going right. to be okay. They've been very, the Gazette's been very accommodating when we've come up on short notice. It doesn't meet their deadline necessarily okay. when, when it comes to these civic announcements. Council of So it'll be at 5 o'clock. The meeting will be at 5 o'clock. Well, all right, let's, let's do this then as an official announcement then. Uh, changing that previous hearing announcement, the new hearing date will be the 24th of this month, March, here in Council Chambers at 5 o'clock as the Finance Committee meeting will convene, and this will be for the purposes to discuss in a public hearing with the public allowed to contribute to that conversation, the, uh, the uh, um, CPI. So, 
it would then come again um, to the full council Correct. at all on, on the on the Thursday, the April second. Would it would it then again come out of finance and to be presented to? It the would be, it, we would have to pass a resolution. That's right. So so would still be, would it would still be on our agenda on April second, but but it would be in addition to the public hearing that had already happened on the 24th. Exactly. Okay, that's helpful. All right, okay, that fires out. Um, yeah. Oh, um, yes. I, I just sure. So, the, and that's at five o'clock? At five o'clock here in the council, council chambers. Ah, uh, okay. For you and I, but we can still Right, that. that's right, I forgot about that, that's right. We'll be presenting, <laughs> Councilor Carney and I, but we'll make it in time for that. Um, now we come up to the uh, communications from the mayor. Now that he's since he's at the podium already, uh, meeting. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was actually just letting uh, the finance director know that this is changing. Oh, I think so that's a reason. She'll have to be there. So, um, so uh, I have a couple of uh, proclamations that I'd like to present um, this evening. Um, the first one is actually uh, timely because it's an event that's uh, happening uh, this Saturday. Um, the proclamation is entitled the 10th Annual Vins Dog Show, uh, March 7, 2015. <coughs> Whereas the Volunteers in Northampton Schools is a private nonprofit organization uh, founded in 1981 <coughs> whose mission is to provide volunteers in all of Northampton's public schools. Whereas the Vins Dog Show was designed 10 years ago as a family-friendly event to raise funds while focusing on fun. And whereas this community event raises about 15% of the $30,000 needed to coordinate the more than 100 volunteers in Northampton schools who support students and staff in our public schools. And whereas volunteer involvement in the schools supplements and enriches curriculum at the direction of the professional staff now, therefore, I, Mayor David Jane Arquitz, to hereby proclaim today as a day to march forth with your dog at the 10th Annual Vins Dog Show, supporting the <coughs> efforts of volunteers in Northampton schools. In witness whereof, I have affixed my hand and paw and affixed, uh, and affixed the seal of the city, uh, David Jane Arquitz, Mayor, City of Northampton. So that's going to be happening this Saturday at, the, at Hamp High in the gym. It's a great event if you've ever been there. Um, Think a big plastic tarp and lots of dogs running around. Um, and, uh, and I'll be actually presenting this to them as well. Um, the next uh, proclamation, uh, I believe it starts at, um, I believe it starts at 10 o'clock, but, le but uh, I can verify that for you. Um, I think I have to be there at 12.30, but I think it starts at 10. Um, somebody Google that quickly and verify okay. that. Um, so, uh, so the, um, the next proclamation I have is uh, entitled uh, Brain Injury Awareness Month, March 2015. Whereas 2.4 million Americans sustain a traumatic brain injury each year, contributing to one third of all injury-related deaths in the United States, and whereas brain injury is unpredictable in its consequences, affecting who we are, the way we think, act, and feel in a matter of seconds. And whereas many of the brain injuries that occur annually in this country can be prevented. And whereas there are many ways to reduce the chances of traumatic brain injury, including wearing a helmet when riding a bike, playing contact sports, skiing, snowboarding, and skateboarding, as well as making living areas safer for young children and senior citizens. And whereas improved treatment, better access to care, and responsible legislation are major considerations when addressing needs surrounding brain injury, but the most powerful tool is prevention. Now, therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, to hereby proclaim the month of March 2015 to be Brain Injury Awareness Month in Northampton. Let us support organizations and programs that assist residents with traumatic brain injury along with their families, but also educate our community about the extent, causes, consequences, treatment, and prevention of traumatic brain injury. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the city seal this fifth day of March. And we have with us tonight a special guest, Mary Collier, who's here. Um, she has been doing a lot of great work in our community as an advocate on this issue of brain injury awareness. And I wanted to invite her to the podium to formally present her uh, with this proclamation. So, Thank Mary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mary, yeah, you're welcome to speak. Thank you. Good evening, City Council members. I, um, 
I know that by now the mayor's assistant has forwarded you an email. I'm here to ask for your help. I really want to talk with you guys. I'm not saying every single one of you, but I would like to talk with you individually somehow. I've been brain injured since 1979. To you, I look like any other girl on the street, but I'm not. I had a severe brain injury. They had to operate on my whole head. The blood clot on my head was that thick. Once, you, once your brain is damaged, it doesn't come back. In the state of Massachusetts alone, right now, we have 3,022 people on a waiting list, looking for homes, waiting for, you know, money. Um, and that's really sad. That's the, that's the reality of it. I live here in this, in, I live in Florence and I live at Tobin Manor. I'm supported by an agency called ServiceNet. They are unbelievable. They have helped me. I've been working, I've been able to talk to the high schools, but I still don't think the students get it because guess what? I'm still seeing students not wearing helmets and that scares me to death because I don't want their families to go what through mine has. I've been very lucky to not only that, but talk to the police. They're really, really helpful. I have ideas, I'm gonna start working on those, but please city council members, I'm gonna hopefully find a way to talk with you individually one-on-one -on -one, so I can get your support. This is a very serious issue. United States alone, nationally, in one year, the cost is 60 billion. That's a pretty chunk of change. My life was changed from the minute I had my brain injury. I go to a conference every single year and show them, this is what I am, this is who I am. Please help me get the students from not only the high school, but the middle schools understand this isn't a joke. It's a very serious issue. Any way you're willing to talk with me and help support the ideas I have, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mary, um, I think it's Councilor Klein indicated all our contact information is available at the website as well as the school committee members who yeah, might want to also speak with Yeah, staff. I have some ideas and I'm starting to work on them. I will go through the mayor and the police department to do this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Your Honor, is that, um, is that it for you? I believe that completes my communication. Okay. There are no presentations scheduled for tonight or license and petitions. <laughs> I will accept the, oh, there are one minute announcements though, which I managed to keep forgetting. Uh, council is back. We have a one minute announcement. In, in our ward, in Ward 2 around Crescent Street, and Franklin Street, and my own house in Massasoit Street in the backyard, I saw this bird, which is a great horned owl, and it, which is amazing and it's awesome. And a lot of people have heard it in the neighborhood in the last couple of weeks. The announcement is if you have cats or small dogs in that area, probably even maybe in the park or even some of your ward um, on Prospect Street, you might want to consider keeping them in for a while. I saw this bird uh, in the daylight. It's not usually seen in the daylight, and it is enormous. I'm going to keep my own big 80-pound dog in for a little while, too. So anyway, um, it's great to see it, but be careful with your animals who are out in your backyard. This, this is a great horned owl big enough to carry an 80-pound dog? Well, we're going to see. We're going to see who wins that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Councilor O'Donnell. I can't top that one. So. <laughs> you uh, what's your wife's try? Right, right. Um, but I would like to, to see that owl yeah. at some point. Um, we can talk about the unicorn in Ward 3. <laughs> <laughs> there are several unicorns in Ward 3, but I only have one minute. <laughs> Um, so I'd just like to announce that on, on Monday, March uh, 16th, uh, there will be a Ward 3 community meeting. Um, it will actually be on the second floor of City Hall. And it has two components to it. At 6 o'clock, we'll be discussing uh, a lot of the traffic mitigation money that's been collected from various building projects in 
the Mont View section of Ward 3 over the years. And our challenge now is to find ways to spend it uh, wisely to uh, uh, improve pedestrian safety and walkability and also do traffic calming potentially in, in, in Ward 3. And at 7 o'clock, uh, the DPW will make a presentation about upcoming uh, construction on the levees um, as required by the Army Corps of Engineers. And that could include removal of some vegetation, including uh, the yew trees on the levees. So the public is invited to come and ask questions and hear about those plans. And, and of course, any other topic that comes to mind is, is fair game as well. So again, that's Monday, Mar March 16th, starting at 6 o'clock, um, second floor of City Hall. Any other announcements? Uh, Councilor Murphy? I want to follow up on the bird. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you don't see it, you might smell it. Because my understanding is they have no sense of smell, and they feast on skunks. So most of the time, a great horned owl smells of skunk uh, because it doesn't matter to the birds. So if you don't see it, you might smell it, but they are fantastic creatures. Yeah. And, and if you are lucky enough to see it and it's not eating your cat. So you, you should keep your skunks inside, too. Keep your skunks inside, too. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we don't have skunks in Ward 5. <laughs> okay. Wow, the things you learned. Um, <laughs> any other announcements? No, no unicorn wrangling events going on in seven? Okay. All right. All right. Dull winter. <laughs> Flying skunks. Uh, it's skunks. Uh, so there are no other announcements. Uh, we now move to, uh, I'll accept a motion relative to uh, approval of the minutes from the last. To approve. Second. Any discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And no abstentions? What's that? I know they got some energy now. They're really, uh, if it, once we get to quarter to one, it's those eyes start to die way, way down. It's just, it'll become mumbled. Um, um, next up, we uh, we also have um, we have minutes from Social Services Veterans Cultural and Recreational Meeting of uh, December fifteenth, twenty fourteen. We have the Public Works Committee of the City Council minutes, uh, January fifth, twenty fifteen. Public Safety Minutes of uh, October 6, 2014, and uh, December 1st, 2014, and then uh, Committees on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinance Meetings of January 12th, 2015. I'm not as a group. You want to move them as a group? Second. Yes. Any discussion relative to those minutes? Let's see if we can get another enthusiastic aye. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah. Uh, all those opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? Okay. That passes. Uh, next up, we come up to the appointments to committees, and we have um, this will be the initial, the inaugural appointments for the Public uh, Shade Tree Commission. Um, we have Marilyn uh, <coughs> Castriata of 79 West Street. Uh, the, her term would begin uh, March 2015, expire June 2016. Todd Ford of 78 Fern Street uh, with the same. Uh, term assignment. Jay Gerard of 158 Ryan Road. Uh, his term is recommended from March 2015 to expire June 2017. Lily Lombard of 39 Monroe Street. Her term to begin March 2015 and to expire June 2017. And then Robert Postal of 44 Washington Avenue. Again, uh, the term starting in March 2015, but to expire Ju uh, June 2018. Andrew Smith of 10 Myrtle Street, uh, the term starting 2015 in March, expiring June 2018. And Jennifer Werner of 16 Winthrop Street, uh, also term starting at the same time, expiring June 2018. I'll accept a motion for referral. Move to second. Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinance. Thank you. And second. And second. And any discussion on those appointments? Uh, referrals? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, next up, we have <coughs> appointment to the uh, Northampton Housing Authority's Jeffrey Jones of 76 Woods <coughs> Road. Uh, his term to start March 2015, expiring June 2018. And this is a reappointment. Move to refer. Second. Second. Okay, so there's a motion to refer and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Any abstentions? 
Uh, next up, Board of Health, Donna Saloom, uh, 83 Pomeroy Terrace, uh, the term starting March 2015, expiring June 2018, and this also is a reappointment. I'll set the motion. Move to refer. <clears throat> Any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And then opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Um, Did we skip over the number nine for just out of? The number nine? Number nine. Agenda item nine? Number nine, we're 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 oh, oh, boy, we did. We did. We just blew right by finance. <coughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. coughs> um, oh, yeah, it's kind of important. Sorry. Should it's okay. <laughs> Out of order. Uh, the We are going to go into recess for the finance committee uh, where Council Murphy will preside as chair of the finance committee. We didn't notice that eventually if we skipped. Yeah, I, it would have come up. We, it it would have come up. When we adjourned at 7.30, it would have, yeah. Somebody would have It's already passed something through. So. so, Pam, would you call our roll, please? Council Murphy. I'm here. Council Adams. Here. Council LaBarge. Present. Council Sheriff. Here. Great. First item is to approve the minutes of January 15th, 2015. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Uh, motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and for orders for tonight, uh, the first one upon recommendation of the mayor, order that $23,000 be appropriated to conduct a comprehensive organizational and management assessment of the Department of Public Works to include operations, service levels, infrastructure management, organizational structure, <coughs> and staffing, and to fund the study, appropriate $11,500 from the FY15 general fund undesignated fund balance and $5,000 from the FY15 Water Enterprise Fund undesignated fund balance and $5,000 from the FY15 Sewer Enterprise Fund balance undesignated fund balance and $1,500 from the FY15 Solid Waste Enterprise undesignated fund balance. Do we have a motion on this? That's going once, going twice. Do we have a motion on this? First Second. Thing? Okay. And the mayor is here to speak about it. Good evening, councilors. Uh, yes, the order before you would, um, would appropriate the twenty-three thousand um, dollars and would allow me to commission a um, a study, a comprehensive study of the DPW. Um, and uh, you know, uh, um, we've we've um, we've experienced or made several sort of structural changes to the DPW in in recent months, including you know the charter change, the administrative order, um, but more importantly. Um, there have been uh, there have been a series of changes that have happened to the DPW over time, whether it's um, adding the uh, landfill to the DPW, um, which previously had been handled by the Board of Public Works, the creation of new um, enterprise funds that we've added to to their plate. Uh, we've also um, had other structural changes. There have been attrition that's occurred uh, during multiple recessions. Um, and so I really think this is an important opportunity, uh, particularly since we've just made these structural changes, um, to really take a close look at the current organizational structure and make sure that it's the most efficient way um, for us to, uh, for public works to be able to carry out their work. I should say that the director um, supports this study, is very actually uh, pleased and, and excited to do this. Um, because he's expressed some of the same concerns over time about, you know, everything from the fact that there used to be assistant superintendents that no, no longer exist. Um, there used to be um, uh, more staff and that they're now increasingly taking on um, more and more responsibilities. There's now a lot more regulatory um, uh, responsibilities. You heard earlier about the, uh, the work that has to be done on the levy and other work related to our, um, to our uh, DP, DEP and EPA permitting. Um, and so I really think this is an excellent opportunity to do that. Uh, these funds would allow me to um, sign a contract with a firm uh, that, that specializes in these kinds of studies. And uh, it would probably be a bit about a 12 week process. Um, and it would involve not only looking at um, uh, how the department is organized, staffed, how it carries out its functions. There would also be um, uh, benchmarking involved to look at how we compare to similar sized uh, DPWs um, in other communities in terms of all these different mit, uh, metrics like staffing and funding and things like that. I think it's, uh, I think it's important um, for us uh, 
to really have a, a better understanding to look at the organizational structure and as we make budgetary investments in the DPW um, to have this kind of assessment to be able to go forward. There was a study performed um, back in, in 2001 uh, by municipal uh, research, uh, municipal resources incorporated MRI. That was during a, 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 a sort of a different period in the, in the department's history. Um, that resulted in some changes. Um, in fact, some of the changes that I've most recently made uh, were actually recommended by that report back in 2001. Um, but that was really a focus studied, uh, focused in many ways more on communication, on, um, on uh, workplace climate. There were a lot of those kinds of issues. We really feel like we have a really well-functioning department. We think we have some really great employees. Um, we just want to make sure that they have the structure in place and that they're working in the right structures to be able to, um, to carry out their mission efficiently. So I think this will be very beneficial, and I would ask for your support. Mm -hmm. Questions for the mayor? No. Um, I'll start fine. Um, so just to understand a little bit more, it's going to be looking at staffing operations, not capital. Um, kinds of costs because I'm wondering how this might inform the capital plan. Uh, it's um, it's going to look at it's going to look at uh, it's really going to be looking internally at the department. So it, it may in fact look at equipment. It may look at equi It's going to look at equipment inventories. It's going to look at those kinds <coughs> of things. Whether they have the equipment and the the fleet to be able to carry out the work they do. Um, so certainly it could inform that. Um, going forward, um, it's going to look at, um, you know, it's going to look at uh, some of the larger assets, for example, like the, um, you know, like like our water and stormwater and sewer. But but it's not going to be a, a review of those of that infrastructure. I think it's going to look more at how they manage it, how they plan, how they, you know, those kinds of things. So more organizational and management level, as opposed to actually looking at the actual assets. I mean, we have very detailed. Um, studies that have been conducted of our stormwater assets. You know, we did the the, the large two-volume um, Camp Dresser McGee study of our stormwater and flood control um, infrastructure, which actually led to the to the creation eventually of the of the enterprise fund that was created to start to uh, uh, whittle away at those projects. We've done similar studies of our of our water and sewer infrastructure. So I think those things are, I mean, and those will probably be the kinds of things they're going to be looking to see have they been done, for example. So I guess I'm just concerned about the timing, because mm -hmm. if we are looking, we're now considering the capital improvement plan, um, and this might actually give us more information about equipment that needs to be purchased and things of that nature. Yeah. You know, how is it going to kind of Will it dovetail timing-wise? Well, the capital improvement program is a is a, is a you know is an ever-changing blueprint, and you're going to approve it, but it's actually it's not going to commit any spending at this point. Um, that would happen during the budget process. So, in terms of timing, um, uh, it it, it uh, the timing might not work out that there'd be recommendations. I'd be very surprised if they got down to the level of recommending you know capital investments. Um, at this at this type of a of an assessment, um, but there'd still be plenty of time to include it in the ongoing capital program if there were major changes. I, w I certainly wouldn't recommend putting the capital program on hold. I mean, we know we know our you know 1971 uh, you know plow needs to be replaced, um, and we know so there's those kinds of assets. We know we're going to uh, need to you know we're going to want to. Pave uh, this this um, this spring and summer as aggressively as we did last summer. So we want to make those. So I think some of those investments are, you know, are, aren't really going to change. But there may be recommendations long term that we'd be uh, looking at. So, uh, Councillor Adams, was this in the FY 2015 budget? No, it was not. No, it was not. That's why this is a. Um, yeah, this is actually something that I'm bringing forward here mid budget year. Uh, which is why I'm asking for the transfer, yeah, uh, to pay for it. Um, it's not something we budgeted for. It's really something, and you know, in, in many ways, um, the experience that we had with the IT assessment um, was very beneficial, and and it's our and you know we've already been been begun to implement some of those um, recommendations. Uh, 
And I think it was very useful to really have someone from the outside come in, meet with staff, meet with uh, managers, meet with um, you know all the various folks, and and really um, give a give an overview and an outsider's perspective of what was happening. And I think the same thing would be very useful for the DPW. Why is it important to do now as opposed to building into the 2016 budget? Well, I really feel, um, you know, we're, I'm at a, and you know, this might be something that I can have um, Director Huntley talk to you about. Um, they've made some requests to me, um, particularly as we look at the budget, as we look at things like the new enterprise fund, as we look at um, all these different responsibilities I've described um, for additional staffing. Um, they have made requests for um, significant additional staffing, um, and as well as um, in the level of, at the management level. And I really feel like, um, I, I don't feel confident in moving forward with those kinds of recommendations without sort of taking a step back to really make sure. I mean, if you, I mean, the org chart, I should have brought it for the current org chart for the DPW is about this wide. Um, and it's, and you know, uh, it's sort of been evolved, it's evolved over time um, as we've added things and moved things, but um, I'm, I'm not convinced that this is necessarily the right configuration. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think it's worth getting an outside set of eyes to look at before we start making hires or building out the current, the current structure, I really, I'd really like to take a look at the, um, at the other structure, at, at, at other potential structures. Would you, Council, who, oh, sorry, you're not done. Who would you expect to do the assessment? Who would do it? Uh, well, we've, um, we've requested, uh, I've, I've requested quotes from three, um, from three separate uh, companies that specialize in this, and, uh, and we would move forward with a, um, if, if the money was secured, we would move forward with the best qualified to do that. Um, so that would be the, and there are, you know, we've, we've, there are different companies out there that specialize in this. We would, we've checked, you know, references of other cities and towns that have gone through similar, um, similar, similar assessments. Um, and so we would try to move forward with somebody quickly and get them on board to get this project started. And I know the DPW is, is, is anxious and excited to do it as well. Can other departments expect to have this sort of comprehensive review? So, you know, I think well? it's I think it's a I think it's a good thing to do over time. I think what I'm um, I just uh, you know the IT one uh, was um, was one that's uh, been you know was a was a priority for me when I came into office. It, uh, the uh, looking at our looking at our IT infrastructure. So that one sort of evolved. Um, over time, we have done we have d done these kinds of assessments. When we um, before we built the police station, uh, we brought in a outside consultant who did a whole assessment of the police force and did sort of a 50-year kind of projection of what our staffing should look like, what our what our force would look like, so that when we built a building, we'd be building it not just for the <coughs> current force, but we'd be building it for the future. Um, we have done similar assessments for the fire department in the past. Um, so it's not something that I'm planning to do on a department by department basis, but I feel like the DPW, um, which is which is a you know considerable uh, part of our city budget and it's one of our larger departments, um, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's a valuable one for that particular department. Um, and, and I would also add we have done. Um, we have done assessments of our financial departments, uh, but we've done it through a technical assistance program with the DOR. So we, we've done we've done those kinds of assessments where we've had DOR come in and do, and those are free. So that's a that's a great thing. So we are always looking at ways to do assessments of departments, but for this type of a size department and this type of a study, I think it's important to bring someone in uh, to do it from the outside. You good? Yes. Councilor Lubarge. Um, Councilor Adams answered a couple of my questions, but Mayor, I think you're going in the right direction. I support this 100%, just like we brought in a consultant for MIS, and it took some time, but you saw what needed to be done there. And I know just with residents alone and hearing from people in the city of Northampton that, and I did get calls because they saw it on the website, 
and they thought it was the right direction to go into. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I remember when you did the, the parking study, mm -hmm. and uh, you asked for bids, and the city received two. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that's that's good or bad, but I'm wondering the amount of money you were planning here, twenty-three thousand dollars, seems it was just a specific amount of money. You know, it's I don't know how you arrived at twenty-three, but I guess my my real question is, is that comparable to say what we spent in two thousand one? Um, on the MRI study. That's and a good would question. I, to, I'm yeah. sorry, just, would you expect it to solicit or to bring in a good number of bids to, to choose from? Actually, I have, I already have three quotes. Oh, you um, have? And so yeah. that $23,000 represents, right. yeah. So I've gone out already and re because of this amount, we don't have to do an RFP. Um, when you're doing a study that's over 35, when you're doing any kind of bidding over 35,000, you have to do a, um, you do have to do a formal RFP. Mm -hmm. But for something like this, and I, I talked to other communities who'd done these studies, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I got sort of a range of what it cost, and most of them were coming in at the 20, mm -hmm. you know, under 35,000. So in that case, under 30B, all we had to do was, um, I sent out uh, proposals to uh, three, the sort of the three top firms that do this, including actually the Collins Center at UMass, um, who've done other assessments for us as well. Um, and so, um, and I received back information from all three of them. Um, as well, actually, MRI was one of them that I reached out to as well, who had done the previous DPW study. Okay. Well, um, that's helpful. Yeah. <coughs> so that's what, so the dollar number is, is sort of based on what we've gotten back from, from quotes. But I can't actually, um, I can't finalize a, any kind of a, a, a deal unless I have the money, unless I have authorization, appropriation to do it. So, do do you know who you would would pick? I kind of expect you to, to say, but uh, or is there still more process to go through? No, actually, I think the firm that I'm very much interested in is a firm called Matrix Consulting. Okay. Um, and they um, have, are very experienced in this, and they have done other uh, studies of other departments, other cities around the Commonwealth, um, uh, uh, Watertown, Gloucester. Uh, they actually were um, in a sort of a different role, were hired by the control board in Springfield to do, um, to do assessments of several city departments there. Um, and they have a lot of experience with public works departments. I've, re I've read some of their other studies that they've done, um, and so they're, um, they come high. And I've talked to some mayors who they've worked with. So they're sort of my leading um, candidate at this point. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. Good, good to know. Yeah. Councilor Kern. Um, maybe more of a comment than a question. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that, uh, and maybe you could uh, concur, that um, this is dovetails uh, nicely with the new role of the mayor's office really in, um, in the major change that we've had where we no longer have a board of public mm -hmm. works that ordinarily in the past might have might have really overseen something of this nature. Um, so it seems as though it, 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 I, maybe you could uh, correct me if I'm wrong but it would help your office kind of take over the management of the, the you know the really structured not the department being really structured, but the oversight of that being mm -hmm. more in the mayor's office with the advisory <coughs> committee. And so were you thinking, having those thoughts in mind? Yeah, I think definitely, as I alluded to, the, the recent structural changes seemed like a good sort of opportunity to, to sort of a reflection point now that we've made these structural changes. And, um, and uh, coupled with the, you know, all the new responsibilities that the department has taken on and, um, and the discussions I've been having with them about looking at the structure and figuring out if it's the best, if it's currently, the, you know, if it still makes sense. You know, you may have heard recently, I mean, it's kind of funny actually, you know, Westfield is, um, you know, going through a major, major uh, reorganization and they're basically, you know, consolidating a lot of what used to be separate departments into one public works department. Um, but then within that, there's also some consolidations that are happening. You know, water and sewer are becoming one, as opposed to two separate, uh, you know, two separate entities with two separate staffs and silos and things like that. So there's, it's those kinds of things it, as we're trying to do more with less, which we've had to do over the last many years, particularly in the public works department. Um, 
you know, if we can find efficiencies the way we've organized the department and the span of control, the span of management, those kinds of things, uh, that's going to make it their jobs easier and it's going to make their service delivery um, much better as well. But really, this department is unique in the sense that we've just had this major change. Totally. Structure. Yeah. And, so and that's definitely not lost to me. And the timing is definitely, that's, you're correct. The timing is, is uh, it's not coincidence that I'm right. bringing this forward now. Okay. Um, and, and, and I do think it's an important, it is a good opportunity now to, to look at the structure. Okay. Yeah. Thank definitely. you. Councilor Klein. Um, I'm assuming that this is just going to be an internal process. There won't be kind of a public component of public That's input. Yeah, input it's, an, it's, it's an assessment. Um, it's an internal assessment. There will be a component in terms of talking to employees and trying to get feedback from them as well. Um, but, you know, one, some part of it will be looking at documents, looking at policies, looking, you know, sort of the mundane stuff of just looking at what's there now what, and, and looking at the current structure, um, looking at the budget. I actually sent the budget to all of the folks so they have a sense of the size and scale and the workforce. Um, and then it will be, uh, you know, my, 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 my um, I, I suspect the way these typically work is we'll put together a working group of folks within the department who'll sort of be a liaison to the, uh, to the consultant um, to help them provide them with the information that they need as they move through the process. Um, so, yeah, it's not really, a, there won't really be a, a public component to it. Yeah. Other questions for the mayor on this financial order? I think it'll be helpful to us as well because we have a new role to play too. Most definitely. In the, in the rate settings and so forth. So I think the study would be good for this body as well to understand what's going on there. Most as, definitely. As we and again, our, this will be a public. Our, have our a new yeah. hat to wear as far as public works. Is and my, my, hope would be, um, my hope would be that at the end of the process, we'd be able to have a presentation that could be made you know, for, the, for the public and for the council so that they'd have an opportunity to hear you know what the recommendations are because obviously some of them could involve uh, could involve um, you know the need to provide additional resources or make structural changes or things like that that would need uh, you know council support. So if there are no other questions, all in favor and finance of a positive recommendation for this order, please aye. say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. <coughs> all right. The next order is uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor, whereas. The Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School Board of Trustees has declared that Building H is available and is no longer needed for school purposes. And whereas Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40, Section 3 requires that the City Council declare the space surplus. Now, therefore, it be ordered that Building H on the campus of Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is declared surplus. The Board of Trustees and the Mayor are authorized to rent the building to Greenfield Community College for a nursing program for an initial period not to exceed four years uh, upon such terms as are approved by the Board of Trustees at Smith Vocational. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second. Second. Excellent. Um, the well, mayor wish to speak to this? Well, as you know, the Board of Trustees um, of Smith Vocational um, and, and Agricultural High School voted, um, I think, uh, two months ago uh, to exercise their option under a uh, memorandum with the rec department, now Parks and Rec Department, um, to, uh, to not have um, the, the Parks and Rec Department located in the um, Building H on the campus any longer. Um, and that's um, actually sort of, you drive through the campus and behind the um, athletic fields, um, and it's located next to what was the tennis court, which is now the solar field. Um, and so, uh, and they have been, and that was done for the express purpose of a new partnership with uh, Greenfield Community College to move a um, licensed practical nurse LPN training program into that space. Um, and so uh, uh, that is moving forward. And as a condition of that, like we do with any city property that's being put out to lease, um, there is a requirement under Mass General Law that the city council um, approve the surplusing of the space to school needs. Um, and so that's why I'm bringing this forward um, for your vote. And, I, and I'm obviously sponsoring it. And, um, and uh, so I'll answer any questions. Council Barge. Yes. How much is the lease? At this point, the lease is still in negotiation. Um, 
and so we they're still working out the terms with um, with GCC and also um, with you know the other state agency that oversees real estate uh, for for the college um, uh, and so that's being uh, negotiated and the trustees as the as the um, you know as the order says will ultimately have to vote to approve that and then I'll have to approve it um, I'll have to ultimately approve the contract as mayor um, so uh, that's that's where we are at this point um, they right. do have a they, I think they have a number now that they're using um, which is I, don't know, I think it's about fifteen hundred dollars a month or something like that but we're in discussions about that I'm very happy about Greenfield Community College working it out with Smith Vocational on the licensed practical nursing program and I know mayor I have stressed about this I think it's excellent so many people have asked for that program to come back but I also have another concern and that is because we have a recreation department now who has to leave Smith Vocational where are they going to go well, we haven't heard anything on this. Yeah, well, we we've been um, we've been doing our due diligence over the last several over the last couple of months since the vote became official, and we've been both surveying um, city property as well as looking at other uh, leasing uh, potential, um, and we've also in fact been looking at um, at the potential for temporary relocation until we can find a longer term. Um, we've even been looking at things like modular office space. Um, as a possibility um, my hope is that we'll have that uh, plan finalized and uh, to be able to announce um, hopefully in the next couple of uh, well weeks and months because we obviously by, according to the vote that was taken we have to have them out of there by June um, so we've been uh, central we've been working with central services the school department uh, to, to identify that and we'll be coming forward with a plan and, and we may need some funding to help support the move uh, initially to make that happen. Um, obviously, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. I certainly understand the, the, sim the synergy between Smith Vogue and GCC. I certainly understand the past history, but obviously, so you know, I have wear my trustee hat, but then I also wear my mayor hat, who's now trying to find a um, a new space for nine employees in a very busy department during one of their busiest times of the year, which is spring when they're planning, you know, little leagues and exactly. all the other activities. So it's going to be a, a challenge, but I've been um, working closely with uh, Ms. Mogio and Mr. Pomerantz, and we hope to um, we hope to come up with a plan. Uh, that will you know meet that deadline for June Okay, because that's where my concern was mm -hmm. knowing that the recreation yeah. department had to move out of there but we're bringing in the nursing program mm -hmm. which I think is great yeah but where do we put our recreation department? Uh, that's true and um, but at this point we don't you know we don't really have a choice in the matter we, you know we we've they've taken the vote we have to vacate the LPN program is temporarily located in Greenfield they were actually at the VA Medical Center. They had to leave there January 1st. They're in temporary quarters in Greenfield. Um, the hope is that June, REC will move out. There'll be some work done to the, to the building to bring it up to what they need for classrooms. And they hope to start in September with um, you know, having the program be operational there. So, uh, so we'll, we are going to try to make it as seamless as possible with the least amount of disruption as possible to the Parks and Rec Department staff um, and I'll keep you updated as soon as we have something more concrete thank you mm -hmm. council Adams so the law requires that the council declares it surplus even though it's school school property mm -hmm. that's correct because it's ultimately city property um, and so um, you know another example of this is when we when um, when the school department through lead school uh, leased some two three classrooms to Clark school um, for hearing um, at lead school that required a surplus vote by both the school committee and then there actually there was a surplus vote by the um, by the city council uh, because ultimately it's it's city property um, after its school property so this is you know just like we've had to do with the James house in order to sign a lease um, just like we had to do with dumpster parking spaces recently um, to try to renew leases for those 
So it's less about approving the lease, it's more about <coughs> the, um, the, 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 the land or the actual facility has to be declared surplus to either school use in this case or city use when it's a city building. So the money from rent will go into a fund that is somehow segregated and if it's yeah it yeah I mean, it's, it, it will it will go into a, uh, a revolving fund similar to what we have with James House similar to what we have with you know Fiker School with other other buildings that we lease out okay. and um, and the lease will spell out responsibilities for both parties um, you know we're, we've been re working most recently with them on insurance and liability responsibilities um, and so those are the kinds of things that we're trying to iron out um, and Joe Cook, our chief procurement officer, is riding, you know, lead on this and is is reviewing all the documents um, because I ultimately will have to approve them once the trustees approve them. So, any other questions, uh, Mr. Council President? Given that <coughs> we have the authority over all city property in so far as the authority of surplus. Um, this actually seems late in the game of the negotiations, at least uh, from the trustees, as far as our participation. And then it would have, I think we would have benefited from, it's similar actually with the Clark School. We had, with the Clark School, we actually had a lot of preliminary discussions brought forward by the school department and in turn by the Leeds um, uh, principal and the superintendent. We're all talking about in advance of us considering a surplusing. I, insofar as I don't disagree with this, but insofar as the, the, the line of authority, and I think we often lose sight that, that, that our authority over property at Smith Vocational seems to, we seem to forget that we actually, it is part of, part of our watch. Mm -hmm. And I suspect the trustees and maybe the superintendent might also kind of forget about that on occasion. And I think, I, I, I mean, in, in this instance, I don't particularly have any objection to it other than, as you said, the timing issue. It seems to me that um, if we can extend the request to this, uh, the trustees and the superintendent that should something like this percolate again sooner, uh, again, that we be apprised of it sooner than at this point, at this juncture where it's basically it's untenable to, to reject it just on the face of it because of process. But at the same time, it seems a little late in the game at the point where we're being consulted. Well, um, uh, for what it's worth, uh, some, some members on the Board of Trustees were feeling like this was brought forward without a lot of advance notice either, um, including this trustee. So, uh, so it's been a, it's been a, um, the process has been uh, less than desirable from my perspective, and I've stated that on the record as a board of, as a member of the board of trustees, and obviously members of the um, uh, members of the Parks and Rec Commission came and spoke to very similarly uh, um, to that perspective as well, um, just in terms of the way this plan was developed and how it, how um, folks found out about it, um, and so. But at this point, that's sort of um, in the past, and frankly. Um, you know, this vote has no, would have no bearing on the, on the Board of Trustees vote relative to the MOA that they had with the Parks and Rec. Um, they could have still done it and, um, and moved another school um, right. facility in there, some other school operation in there, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's just because they're not using it for a city or school use that they need the surplus vote. So, right, I, yeah. essentially, I mean. And actually, I, I was the one who insisted that this vote needed to happen and it was not without some um, back and forth and discussion legally that that to remind them that this actually did have to happen well I, I, yeah that's so that's actually more my concern is reminding yeah. that the, the 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 order of review of review mm -hmm. should not be given short shrift here and I think that that um, um, I, I, you know, the superintendent's new doesn't necessarily know how this breaks out, but the fact is that that um, it's as we try to make these lines clearer and brighter relative to chain of authority and responsibility, it, I think it'd be appropriate for in the future for uh, the uh, these kind of processes, particularly when it's obviously when it's relative to surplusing, mm -hmm. um, because 
you know, when we've surplus other properties, we've had an opportunity to have public hearings and we have people discuss their feelings regarding that and um, when we surplus for sale, for sure. Yeah. Um, in this case, it's a lease and it's required by master and law, but the fact is I, I uh, that's all I'm expressing my concern about totally. it is just so that in, in the future. And I hear it loud and clear and that's actually, you know, one of the, the um, we're in the middle of hopefully coming close to the end of a, a speaking of studies, um, we, we've been undergoing a, um, a, a nine month study with, with the Donahue Institute at the University of Massachusetts that uh, was actually commissioned um, at, the at my request and the request of the trustees to the Department of um, Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, who actually funded the study um, to look at the governance and uh, governance structure and, uh, and financial uh, structure of Smith Vocational. It's been a long-standing topic. It's a, it's a somewhat anomalous um, uh, structure. Um, we're the only city in the Commonwealth that has two school districts. Uh, and then we have this other added um, complexity of its, uh, you know, the will and all of the implications of that. So it's a very unique situation. Obviously, great school, wonderful tradition. Um, agricultural education, only one of four in the state that's providing that kind of education. Um, so we're hopeful that that study is going to give us a way to look at possible changes in the future to that organizational structure. So, so anyway, it's timely. Councilor Adams. When is the lease to commence? Again, it would be, um, I, believe, <coughs> I believe they, uh, I think their school session starts in September but it's actually going to start sooner than that because they need some time to move in and get all set up and things like that. So probably okay. July, something along those so lines. So just two points. I don't, I don't think this is um, a little late in the game. This is the beginning of March, and it's not going to start until July. But, but also, I have to point out, this is on the recommendation of the mayor. Mm -hmm. So I think it's um, a, a misguided criticism to fault the Smith Volk trustees. They, don't bring this, they didn't bring this forward. Thank you. If there's any, if there's any criticism, it'd be hard to point out. It'd be hard to criticize the trustees when they didn't bring it forward. Uh, Councilor Dwight. Well, to that point, yeah, whoever is responsible for it should bear the responsibility. But the the fact that the trustees actually are responsible for bringing it forward to us, and if you're saying they haven't brought it forward to us yet, then I would say that's very late in the game. It's even later still. I, I it, my principal concern is that normally what we have done in the past for surplusing discussions that there was an opportunity for the public to have a public meetings discussion and participation our participation so far was notification we were notified uh the, the mayor notified us in uh in, in his and uh, in, in his period where he's allowed to uh speak to us and I, beyond that there's been no other formal other than this formal address to us so if, if that's on the mayor, then it's on the mayor. But if it's also, but I do believe the trustees and the, uh, um, and, and by extension, the superintendent bears some responsibility as well. And I'm, and I, I'm, a, and I'm a trustee, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I, you know, I'm, You're covered in the I'm trustee many, criticism, yeah. Well, yeah. You can, so you can criticize me in either capacity. But, um, but again, this is more of a, I don't want to downplay its importance, but you know, in a situation where the school department, or in this case Smith, are leasing something, it's n it's a little bit different than leasing a city property or leasing, you know. So it's a, because then the council and the mayor would have a little bit more direct role. In this case, the school department, you know, the school committee is the one signing the lease and executing the lease, not the mayor. So the council's not authorizing the mayor to do it. So it's it's a little bit different, but I but your point is well taken. And I mean, I did notify the council as soon as I was notified that we had been given notice. Um, and that triggered this process and any time they would be leasing to any non, any time the building would be used for non-school use, a surplus vote would be required. Um, there was some confusion um, relative to that and some um, disbelief about that being a requirement that we needed to work through. Uh, which is why it's it did take a little bit longer, but we are still. I mean, the the lease you know doesn't take effect until July, so we do still have. Well, that's lease. that's one of the clear bright lines. I exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, other questions on this one yeah. from anyone? All right. Then in finance, all in favor of a positive aye. recommendation, please say aye. Aye. Opposed. All right. 
And speaking of Smith Folk, upon the recommendation of the mayor, order that $175,000 be appropriated for the following projects from the <coughs> FY15 general fund undesignated fund balance to Smith Vocational and Agricultural School for the purposes of meeting FY14 and FY15 net school spending and provide for the following extraordinary maintenance. Bleacher repair in the gym, which is building B, $60,000. Classroom intruder lock sets, $50,000. And security cameras, $65,000. Do we have a motion finance? Make a motion. Second? Second. Great. Uh, okay, please. So um, this is, uh, these are some um, items that, uh, that Smith Vocational um, have requested actually they requested it as part of the capital improvement program so Councillor Murphy would have seen these as part of their um, submissions um, we have a requirement that uh, DESE the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, has imposed relative to meeting our obligation for what's called net school spending uh, both for FY 14 and for FY 15 um, and so our intent here is to appropriate this one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars which would meet that requirement um, but appropriate it specifically for these extraordinary maintenance projects that they'd like to accomplish um, and extraordinary maintenance projects of less than one hundred and fifty thousand dollars qualify as a as a net school spending uh, creditable um, uh, uh, appropriation charge. So that is the purpose of um, of needing to do this. Councilor Klein, um, I wanted to ask about the cameras specifically. Is this okay. installation of cameras or is it maintenance of cameras that already exist? I believe it's it's ex uh, it's expanding. Uh, their uh, current cameras to include parts of the campus that are not currently um, you know, they have a very big and sprawling campus they hired a security director this last year and um, and have done sort of a full survey of the campus and they um, believe that they need to um, expand that and to add some cameras and other parts of uh, of the campus so I have some real concerns about the concept of surveillance I'm wondering um, is there an audio component to the cameras or it's simply <clears throat> yeah the the way that the cameras work um, I don't believe there's audio though the only audio would be at the entrances to the door where you'd have a push button to buzz into the offices which we have at all of our schools um, and generally these are cameras that are at entrances at, at the various entrances and exits so that we have a record of who's coming and going um, from the building so um, so that's the uh, that's the plan actually I can you can I can certainly provide you uh, it's actually part of your capital improvement program it's mm -hmm. it's it's one of the um, it's one of the sheets that's in the program but uh, but I can direct you to that that actually describes the uh, the project itself it's very similar to what we've done at the high school um, and at all of our other um, elementary schools um, to Unfortunately, um, in the age of Columbine and uh, Newtown, uh, where we've had to beef up, um, you know, security and make sure that entrances that we know who's coming in and out of school, um, and then obviously when we have incidents or situations or, or lockdown situations, then we have a record of who 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 may have come in and out of the school. So you're absolutely certain that these are just for entrances and exits. That's my understanding. The rest of this That's my understanding, but we can certainly, um, I can certainly verify that with you. Because um, I'm really concerned about the, just the implications of a school as a place where violence or theft is taking place. I think that once you put cameras in there, there is this culture of surveillance, which I think is is a concept that we have to be thinking really carefully about in terms of what we want in our schools the culture and atmosphere in our schools so I just had some concern about that okay. um, the other thing is I think that there there's a, uh, uh, a concept of reasonable expectation of privacy um, under the Fourth Amendment the of the US Constitution and, and there are some legal issues around surveillance cameras in schools that I'm concerned about so I want to make sure that the placement of the cameras is really for the purpose of just checking who's coming in and out. It's not for other kinds of surveillance, and I'd really like to be reassured that there's no audio recording happening. 
Um, and also there needs to be explicit notification of uh, recording happening so that there are things put up, signs put up, so that staff and students are always aware that those cameras are operating. So I just want to make sure that those kinds of things are in place. Okay. Adams. I can pass that on to the security folks at Smith Vogue. Um, I had similar concern too. When, when you stated mm -hmm. that um, that's got an expansive campus, are, you, are they surveying like some of just their lands as opposed to, you know, the... No, I'm the, talking about, you know, you know, Northampton High School, there's one primary building um, with a front entrance and then there are some, you know, rear entrances and emergency exits and things like that. But, you know, the Smith campus has the main building, it's got building B, it's got the ag building, it's got the tech building, it's got the, um, the old uh, campus. I mean, so there's like, it's, there's multiple buildings on a campus that all have entrances and exits and people that need to come in and out of those buildings. Um, and you know, it's a fairly open campus and this, and I think they want to encourage that, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, the downside of the open campus is that folks can come onto campus and could theoretically enter a shop or enter one of the, one of the outbuildings that's away from the administration buildings. And so they want to have the same kinds of, um, same kinds of security measures in place there. Would you be willing to report on some of those questions? Sure. Yeah, I can certainly I can certainly um, get answers for you on that. You. Um, and I know, um, and I'll try to find the specific reference to that CI, um, CIP sheet that would be in your capital improvement program yeah, book. Because every project that's I in your that. book, it may not be in there. Um, it, is. it is okay. Um, if it's a project that we aren't recommending funding for, it might not be in there. But I'll I'll I can get you that sheet. It was part of the CIP's review process. So I can get that distributed to you. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Then in finance, all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Is there any business that uh, anyone has that we did not reasonably expect to come up? So two less comments before we adjourn. A very handsome photo on the internet today of our mayor uh, 30 years ago as an Eagle Scout. Uh, <laughs> very nice picture. Okay. And I've had an overwhelming need to call you Councillor Collins tonight. It's a very handsome bow tie you have on over there. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Um, I mean, we convene back in regular session, <clears throat> and as is our want, we go right back to the top of the financial orders for the new financial orders, and the first one up, of course, is the, the, the order to appropriate funds for organizational and management assessment of the DPW, and this will be a first reading. I'll accept a motion. Second it. Any further discussion on this item? Roll call, Pam. Councilor Carney. Yes. 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 Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 The next up is the finance order for Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School building surplus uh, for the rent. Joe Building H. There's a motion. Second. So, second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on this? Roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sarah. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. That passes unanimously in first reading. Uh, as of the last one, I should note, and <coughs> for second reading at our next meeting. Um, next up is the financial order for free cash to SVAHS for extraordinary maintenance and net school spending. Um, motion. Second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Councilor Donald first and then Councilor Klein. Um, my uh, question, I guess, is a procedural question prompted by um, Councilor Klein's comments. Um, since the Council is sort of in control of a, the appropriation of this um, at the risk of, of irritating people. I wanted to ask, I mean, do we ever amend orders to put conditions on them? Uh, this is security cameras. Could it say security cameras for external use? <coughs> I'm not making that motion. It's just a question 
Maybe I have irritated. So. <laughs> no, you haven't. I just, I guess I would request because it's not my, it's a, you know, it's a capital project that's been put forward by Smith Voke. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd ask you to first look at that and, um, and then if there's an issue or the council doesn't want to approve it, they could withdraw it. Um, I guess I'd want to, I guess I'd, in fairness to them, because this is really a school department, Smith School Department project, I'd like to have them be able to address it. Um, so uh, before you do that, because again, we have athletic fields there, we have other, and we have, unlike most other um, schools, they do have some open air classroom areas, um, specifically in the barns and in the, um, the forestry department and in some of the other areas of the, of the campus as well. So I would be, I guess I'd want to have someone from their security f come, come address this rather than me agreeing to that type of a requirement. Uh, and I guess, oh, if I could just follow up, I mean, there may be complexities and nuances there and you would want to get the opinion of the, of the school as well, but I guess my question still stands, is this something that we can do procedurally? Um, and Councilor Spector, do you want to speak to that point? Um, uh, Councilor Klein was next. No, I don't want to speak. Okay. Um, uh, because I don't know. Uh, procedurally, I'm. We can amend orders, but um, and I and and you can propose an amendment, and then we can discuss what that would be. But we we can we can amend orders, and Councilor Klein. Well, I just wanted to say uh, I'm willing to support this tonight, but I do want to look deeper into it and get some answers to those questions. It's partly kind of the spirit of um, trying to move us away from kind of surveilling our students and staff, but also it really is a legal issue that the city could be held liable for that we need to be informing people of the fact that they're being videotaped. I also am concerned though about the legality of the potential uh, reporting because there have been, there is legal precedent of cases that uh, schools have been sued for um, audio recording students and staff. So, you know, there's just a legal component there that I think the city could be held liable for that we need to be reassured around before we can take, you know, a vote. Right. And I, I mean, there is the <laughs> issue of informed consent as well. Um, which we have to abide by by Mass General Law when we when we conduct these meetings and when we have public meetings. <laughs> Um, if, if that is mandated under law, um, it seems to me that, you know, that we express the caution that we abide by the law and provide informed consent for notification of uh, recording devices at entrance points so people know that they're being recorded. And relative to the audio recording, you're right, there is precedent law as far as I understand. Um, but to that extent, we don't need to amend for that because that's already built into the law. Um, but I don't know if you're saying something beyond what's already mandated for. I'm just saying that we need to have those answers to make sure as a that, council that, that, to make sure that those things are in place in order to terms. make a decision, I think. Is there to, to, um, a thought towards an amendment or, or would you prefer, would you, no, I think I, the mayor certainly understands what we're talking wanna, about. But. Yeah, just to, to that point, I mean, I agree that more consultation should happen before I certainly would offer an amendment tonight. But and the thing is that secure, I mean, the term security camera is just a generic right. term for a project that, you know, it's a, so it's not, I'd rather have you see the full detail of the project. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I don't yeah. think that's a, meant to be an all inclusive description of the project. So, exactly. Yeah. Comes with respect. I, for, I would be comfortable with also voting on this tonight. And, and if we either got that information or had somebody from Smith Voke who could be here at our next meeting, I mean, our choices are either seem to be either we vote for it, we table it, we take a first vote. I'm happy to take a first vote as long as we know we'll have that information. And it may even be better to have somebody here so we can speak with them. I'm not sure who, exactly who do, that Do would they be. have a security staff person? They do. They have a security a person that's there. Can we extend an invitation can, via your office? On that. Okay. Yeah, I can work on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, is that satisfactory to everyone for the, yeah. for the first yeah. roll call? Yeah. Okay. Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. 
Uh, okay. That passes in first reading. The next reading will be at our next meeting uh, in March. Uh, next up is the financial order for the Amber Lane Parklet. This is second reading. I'll accept a motion on this. Motion. Second. Uh, as you heard, uh, the the parklet seems to be fairly well received <coughs> by Butters and others. Uh, any further discussion on this point? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Wilson. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Specter. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Yes. Council Murphy return. Council Murphy, are you abstaining from these votes? We have we just did two votes without you. So. Aye. Yeah, okay. Um, next up we have uh, this is also in second reading. This is a financial order for uh, Dorowan Boggy Meadow Road. And I'm never confident about pronouncing that correctly. Second. Does anyone want to correct my pronunciation on that? Deruin. Deruin? Works for me. Typically that spelling is Okay, I didn't, I've never seen it typically, so I wouldn't know. Uh, <clears throat> so the motion's made and second. Any further discussion on this item beyond the, the, the pronunciation? Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Specter. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Lavar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. That passes in second reading and it has passed. Uh, next up, we have the financial order for the Steidler family donation. Uh, this is also in second reading. I'll accept a motion. Second. Okay. In second, any further discussion? Are you sure about the pronunciation? That one I'm okay with. I feel a little more confident about the Steidler pronunciation. I, you know, and I should be able to pronounce French stuff. That's my family, but. Uh, so, no further discussion. <laughs> Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Specter. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Lavar. Yes. This uh, mm, that go for it. That passes in second reading and uh, uh, unanimously. So next up is the order for the Vacelli family donation. Uh, Vacelli. That one. Vacelli. Vacelli. <laughs> the Vacellis. Yeah, okay. So the motion's made in second. And any further discussion on pronunciation? <laughs> Shall we? So, That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, on on which one? On the Seidler family? Right. Council of the Barge made the motion. I think Council O'Donnell seconded. Yeah. How about Shelley? Shelley, who's who made the motion? I did. You have a Council of the Barge? I'll second that motion. And Council Specter seconded it. The Vachellis. <laughs> all right. How about we clear all that up? Uh, roll call, please. Council Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Lavar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. That passes in second reading. <clears throat> Next up is the financial order. This is in second reading uh, for the transfer of land on Driver Side Drive. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'll accept the motion. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second, second it. Uh, any discussion on Riverside Drive? On the discussion last time. <laughs> Roll call, please. I just want to make sure I'm on the right one. I don't have H. Agenda. Letter H. Letter H. H. <laughs> Financial <laughs> number, number H. Oh, yes, <laughs> indeed. Councilor <laughs> Yes. Yes. That passes in second reading as well. And then next up, we have the financial order for conservation restriction on one acre, acre, 1.0 acres off uh, West Hampton Road. Made is there a second? Second. second. Uh, any discussion? This is in second reading. Roll call, please. This Council. is I, number Council. I. <laughs> Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. 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 That passes in second reading. Um, we have next up the um, 
This is the uh, order for Scanlon Avenue. This is to uh, this also uh, to correct the Scribner's error on reference to the plan. This is the first reading. Um, and I'll accept the motion to put it on the floor, and then we can discuss the Scribner's so error. So moved. A second. And you want to talk about the... Right. Order, so we need to correct that. Um, so, as amended, <coughs> to, for the correction of the Scrivener's error, any further discussion on this item? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Robart. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Yes. Councilor Abbas. Yes. Councilor Sherry. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. It's a Scribner's error, not a Scribner's error. It's <laughs> Damn. Uh, Scribner's error and Scribner error. Scribner. <laughs> Mr. Scribner. Um, this is second reading for the order for primary election to be held on September 22nd, 2015. Made. Any further discussion on that? We making the adjustment for Rosh Hashanah. Municipal primary. Roll call, please. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Next up, we have an order pertaining to bicycle and pedestrian facilities with amendments, amendments recommended by the Transportation and Parking uh, from January 20th, 2015, with amendments recommended by the Planning Board uh, February 12th on 2015 without recommendation from the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. Um, the, I, I can read this if you like. Um, it's, and, and then we can have actually an explanation that goes along with it if you we want. We can recognize See. Carol. Or oh, Carolyn's here. Yeah. And there was a motion to waive reading, so, yeah, but I'll so accept the motion to uh, recognize Carolyn if you want to. Move to recognize Carolyn Mish. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I didn't even see you there. He's <laughs> got here. You just got in. Okay, you haven't yeah. been sitting there the whole time, have you? Okay. Um, well, I have a quick presentation to save you from reading all the text. It's okay. Dense. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is uh, an ordinance that addresses um, both uh, in section eight, uh, which is our general parking section, as well as definition section and our site plan section, um, bicycle and sidewalk standards that were already requiring applicants to um, design for but we don't have specificity so this that's why there's this is so dense with a lot of specificity can you um, start slideshow from the beginning thank you okay thanks <laughs> I didn't have more control um, so the first part uh, uh, deals with bicycle bicycle storage bicycle parking and we actually created a definition for bicycle um, parking and it's and it's um, no longer ad hoc you can't hang your bicycle upside down and call it a um, bicycle parking on a post mm -hmm. um, so we define short-term storage and long-term storage meaning shelter bicycles um, storage spaces um, and also the minimum number of spaces which is probably the key to all of this is going to be based on square footage and there was a lot of discussion um, I think both at the planning board level and parking and transportation about this but one of the keys here is that um, this the <coughs> parking spaces for bicycles would be um, similarly applied as we do for parking spaces in that if there's new construction or expansion or a change of use from one use to another, then that would trigger a reevaluation of how many bicycle parking spaces are required. Um, so this is the table that's actually pulled right out of the ordinance. And we've classified them into sort of residential type categories where we would require um, a, ten, a point 0.1 um, space per dwelling unit. And 50% of those would 
um, need to be long-term parking, so covered or sheltered um, parking. So it can be indoors or just under um, a sheltered space. Um, so at point one per space means you're really not going to provide or need to provide any parking until you get to five units um, or a five, um, five unit multifamily. <coughs> the next category is more of a commercial category and um, institutional category, one space per thousand square feet. The red um, text here indicates a modification that has come through the process Commercial retail was um, originally, um, rec or it started out as um, one space, um, I'm sorry, half a space per thousand square feet. And through parking and transportation, it got bumped up to one space, so we merged the categories. So that's the biggest, the bulk of the categories are in that second line there. Then for manufacturing and industrial uses, 0.1 um, space per thousand square feet of floor area. Schools, K through 12, um, college classrooms, labs, or other teaching areas would be five spaces for, per classroom. That was amended through the process as well. Um, that went, got bumped up from um, originally one space per classroom. The other modification <coughs> is that business or tr trade and industrial schools used to be, or originally were lumped in that same classification and there was a discussion at the planning board that business tra and trade schools are slightly different. There's more, um, typically more commuter traffic from farther afield coming to those types of schools. So they separated, um, the planning board recommended separating that out and move that forward to council with that recommendation as two per classroom under that scenario versus five. And uh, similarly, um, the way parking for cars are treated, uh, for any mixed use, you look at each individual use and determine how many bicycle parking spaces would be required for each use and then add those together. Um, and then again, as with car parking, any use that's not listed would be um, up to the determination that, um, by the building commissioner to um, determine what's the best, the closest use to, to the table, essentially. It, it, it's fine. Go ahead. Um, well, is, this, is this based on a study? Is this just, I mean, where does this come from? So w we originally got technical assistance from uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to look at other ordinances around the country and in Massachusetts um, in particular. So Pioneer Valley Planning Commission in, um, did um, an analysis and presented that to staff we looked at it and sort of tested it based on uh, projects that have come before the planning board, um, most recently um, the hotel and some other big commercial um, projects, and sort of thought about, and as well as um, thinking about classroom space and thinking about demands for parking, let's say, for schools. So um, to a certain extent, the numbers, um, originally were taken from what other communities have, have done, but tweaked to match sort of what seemed to um, be the demand here. Well, let me ask you this. For example, um, you take uh, one, of the, one of the grammar schools. How many, how many spaces, how many classrooms does um, you know, JFK or, or LEED school has, have? Do we have any idea off the top of our heads? Because, I mean, it, I, mean I don't know what that number is. Is it 12? Is it 20? And, and, and if we multiply that by five per classroom, does that really reflect the need? Or is that just to make us feel good about the number of uh, how we're accommodating bicycles? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I understand the Pioneer Valley Com Planning Commission did a study, but is it based on the actual need in the city? Um, well, I think if you look at five per classroom, typically they're about, you know, let's take elementary school, 20 to 25 kids in a classroom. So you're talking about, you know, um, a qu quarter or, or um, a fifth of, of what would be, you know, of those kids might ride to school on a given day if you just sort of break it down by classroom. Um, 
I think, you know, we didn't go school by school and say how many classrooms are in each school, so therefore what does that mean in terms of number of parking spaces? Um, but we you also, if you go by the high school uh, um, during not the peak winter season, but there are bikes jammed up everywhere in front of the school, um, you know, beyond just the bike parking, um, you know, the bike slots. So we didn't count how many extra bikes are just um, locked to the fence at the church or other posts at the high school, but they're certainly um, uh, well utilized. At well, I guess my point is that there may certainly you may certainly need, need more bicycle, you know, spaces for bikes at the high school or other places. But mandating by a very specific formula, um, not only schools but all these other various, you know, entities and places have to follow this formula. It'd be tough for me to support it unless I knew it was based in, 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 some, in, some, in some real need. I mean, it's one thing to, to say that they need more, but then there's another thing to just come up with this with this uh, strict formula when it's really not based on actual need. Council Shara and then Council O'Donnell. But am I correct that this is for new construction and the change of use? So you wouldn't, we, suddenly we wouldn't have to require the elementary schools to put in however many more? Right. Okay. Right. So it's if we were to build a new one. Sure. Right. My question Doesn't still holds, though. If we're building a new, new facility, we don't know what their need is, why would we mandate this? <coughs> uh, Councilor O'Donnell, uh, then Councilor LaBarge, and then Councilor uh, Specter. Um, right after the table is the sentence, the Office of Planning and Sustainability can authorize a reduction in parking requirements when there are unique reasons why new bicycle parking is not required, including the availability of adequate public bicycle parking. Um, and so forth when there are better options. Do, does that sentence hold to every instance in the, in the table and does that provide the flexibility we would need to, to tailor each situation? Right, that's sort of, that's the, um, that's the out, <laughs> essentially. Or, you, you know, you have the ability to provide the rationale why, you know, a 10 unit apartment building doesn't need, um, um, you know, uh, two spaces or one space, um, and 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 then s sort of we looked at the most. We have two and going back to the multifamily, not necessarily the commercial piece, but multifamily. We recently had two um, projects on Pleasant Street. One was a 72-unit um, uh, multifamily structure, and the other is 55 units. Uh, we were getting nine parking space, nine or ten parking spaces at one that the planning board asked to have parking shown. That seemed um, like a reasonable number at that level, but we just didn't have the number written down. So a lot of the effort to this point has been analyzing what's being proposed, whether it makes sense, and, you know, outside storage, certainly you've got, if you have one bike loop, that actually holds two bicycles. So. Um, it's not a whole lot of parking space allocated for bicycles, but um, and, and so to a certain to a certain extent, it is sort of made up, but based on what we've seen come through um, the permitting process, and also having that outlet to say have an applicant come forward and say, you know what, this is far too many for what we think the demand is, and it's onerous, so we'd like to have this other number instead. <coughs> Council LaBarge, Council Spectre, and then Council Klein. So, Carolyn, going through on this ordinance, what we're actually doing is putting a standard in place because there right. has to be a standard. Right. There is a standard to provide bicycle parking, right, but it's just not specific as to the type, the location, exactly. and the uh, amount. Council Spectre. Yeah, and Council Adams, I understand your point, but I think in part what we're, you know, sometimes you do these things is what's going to happen in the future and to also change behavior. You know, if you provide a ton of parking somewhere downtown, people will drive cars. If there's tougher parking, sometimes people will walk. So there's, I mean, I think the high school is a good example where bikes are just, I mean, I remember even a few years ago, my kids were there. It was like, they weren't gonna ride their bike there. It was like, there were just bikes everywhere. And um, it just, so it's encouraging a certain kind of behavior. I don't think that's the main thrust of this, but I think it's certainly one. And I think the fact that there are outs to this and that 
if it's going to be onerous, um, someone can apply to, to change that I think it, it, um, is a good thing. So I think we need to look down the road because if I think if we look back, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago, the kind of bike use has gone up dramatically in this town from where it was. And I think in part that's because we, we now have bike lanes, we now have bike trails, we now have become a more bike friendly community. And you become more bike friendly and say a lot more people use bikes. We might not have been able to predict that 15, 20 years ago and say, oh, the need is there. So it. Um, now, Councilor Klein, uh, Councilor Spector did direct something to Councilor Adams and he's allowed an opportunity to rebut. Okay, Councilor Klein. I actually want to kind of echo what Councillor Spector is saying. I think that I appreciate your um, desire for kind of research and, and numbers kind of to support a policy decision, but I think that policy is also we create it aspirationally. We're hoping to encourage particular behaviors and um, be forward thinking, and, and I think that that's what this does. If we have, you know, we're expanding the number of places for bikes, we are hoping, in fact, and encouraging through all kinds of policies across the spectrum to encourage bike riding. So um, I think it's a great idea. Councilor Adams. Here, here's my concern, is that what this does is it, 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 it mandates this formula, which we acknowledge is made up to a certain extent, and, and you can get um, a reduction in the in the uh, man of, of what's mandated if, if the planning board allows it. But similarly, if this didn't exist, they could the planning board could also tell you you need more bicycle bicycle spaces. So, you know, it it, it kind of switches the board <coughs> a little bit. And um, and and when I read this, I just thought it was extremely burdensome. And I, I you know it's 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 a laudable goal ultimately. And I think we're doing well with how um, how bike friendly Northampton is. But um, but it is an obstacle for developers, and 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 and, and do we have um, any testimony from developers? Do do we have any uh, you know any support from developers? Do we do, do we know what their concerns are? If they have any concerns about this at all, I mean, that's what I'm thinking about. Well, I think right now we do have a standard where, in order to get your site plan approved you need to show that you're accommodating bicycle storage but there's no number so i think the the um, unknown for um, developers is worse than not having a standard that might feel like it's a little more than the demand or, or the requirement or the demand would be for that but they know what to expect expect <coughs> going in whereas if there's something open-ended the planning board could ask for a number that's really um, sounds maybe outlandish to, um, I mean, maybe it wouldn't, but maybe it does. And then um, the applicant is stuck not knowing if I don't agree to having this certain number that's not written down anywhere, am I get, not going to get my permit approved? But so I think that, uh, I mean, we've, we've historically, we've seen that um, developers are much more comfortable knowing exactly what everything is in the book before they come forward, rather than having a series of obligations that are um, loosely defined um, that may um, continually add up um, if, if to a, an expense. If the developer brought a project to the planning board and the planning board <coughs> felt that there wasn't enough spaces for bikes, they could simply mandate that, right? Right. So, so I, there it is. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, that, I mean then, then I, then I don't understand, then I don't understand the need for this. Council if, Murphy if is inadequate. If there are Sorry. inadequate spaces for bicycles, the planning board can simply say you need more. So, so I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't see the benefit of it. Council Murphy hasn't spoken yet, and neither has Council Carney, and then Council Spector. Oh, just a question, Carolyn. You're, you're going to continue in your presentation uh -huh. and describe what a bike space is under this ordinance, how much space is required for right. bike. That's coming, right? Right. Okay. Right. And, and just to clarify too, it's understood then that. Uh, the developer came in that the number that is set down on the chart is the maximum that the planning board would require there might be right. some there might be some let up if there was a, a I mean a reduction in yeah. spaces mm -hmm. if that was demonstrated or shown but a developer would never expect that they would be over and a, once they've looked at this number they wouldn't then have to provide more than what's on the table right. exactly yeah. 
And, and I think the, sort of to go back to um, what Councillor Adams was saying, I think what we've seen is more of the issue that applicants are concerned that they're not going to know what that number is right. going in and that we don't have um, a standard saying what type of um, system, how far apart, you know, what the style is, how much am I actually going to have to outlay for this. And that's actually um, more of a burden that we've seen than um, having an open-ended number and having the planning board right. pick something out of a hat based, you know, at mm -hmm. the time, the moment of the public hearing. So you, you want to continue with your uh, presentation? Oh, I, I had oh I'm sorry. I'm just Council addressing Spectre. Councilor Adams again. You know, we already, we do these kind of standards in other ways too. Um, automobiles, parking being one. I mean, we could say, well, if it's silly for bikes, why do we do it for parking? I think, again, it gives us some framework, it gives developers a framework. I also would question the onerous quality of the, that supposing a developer was coming in is going to do a restaurant of 10,000 square feet, which is a pretty good size space. and going to build that. What we're talking about would be 10 bike spaces. I, I'm not sure that that would be particularly onerous when you look at the scale of the project, just in terms of common sense that you're talking about putting out front of bike rack. So um, I think we, even though you know, it may look like five spaces per classroom is really large, but when you're talking about a new building, this is a very small piece of an overall development. Councilor Dong, you have a follow-up? Um, I, I would hate to just keep adding opinions to this. I know you want to continue to, with your, yes. your presentation, so I'll just be, be very brief, but I would just follow up on what Councilor Spector said and say, I mean, this is, this is zoning. So, I mean, in theory, we could turn over all of zoning to an unelected planning board, and they would just make all decisions in a discretionary fashion. But I don't think we ought to do that. I think we ought to set standards for what we want to see in a variety of measures, and this is something we aspire to in the city. Um, so I like the idea that we're setting, um, we're setting a course for a future demand, if not, if not current demand. It's appropriate that the elected um, branch of city government make those decisions to supplement what the planning board does. Um, so the ordinance also goes into detail about where uh, bike store should be, not at the back of the lot, um, far away from the building front, but within 50 um, feet of a primary entrance. And if the primary entrance is within 50 feet of the street, um, it should be in, you know, between the street and the, and the building. Um, it can also be within the right of way if approved by the city. And that could mean either in the street or the right of way that includes the sidewalk, depending on, you know, um, wh how much space there is to accommodate that. Um, the ordinance discusses dimensions and spacing, so the um, bike racks need to be two and a half feet um, apart and three feet essentially on center in length to give enough room to maneuver around and store bicycles um, next to each other and get in and out. To lock and unlock and then it talks about alignment so that you know they're perpend they're um, parallel to each other or arranged um, in a line and then spacing how much spacing between each if they're in um, alignment <coughs> and then there's standards for separation from the curb you want two feet um, from the curb for safety and eight feet from hydrants um, and then there's a preferred style that was identified and that's been in, we have a parking, a bicycle parking guide that's been, uh, that was adopted by the Parking and Transportation um, Committee several years ago. And this has been sort of the working guide for applicants, but it's never been in zoning. There was another standard that was in the original ordinance, um, but has since, there's a recommendation to drop the, um, the wave. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are the two preferred um, bike racks, but again, you know, other options are available. But if if applicants just want a um, quick solution, they can pick one of these. Um, so that's it for bicycle storage in terms of um, the standards there. And the next piece of the ordinance is in the site plan section, which is about sidewalk construction. And this brings, again, is sort of the same details that we require 
um, peop, um, applicants, but it's not in the zoning. We, we have standards in Department of Public Works. We have standards in the subdivision regulations, but we want to bring those same standards over um, for zoning and particularly in commercial areas. So there's there are dimensional requirements for the width of sidewalks in residential districts versus commercial districts, um, ramp um, grades and so forth. Um, grids that are in the um, sidewalk, we want to make sure they're not too wide so that, and if they're more than a, a quarter of an inch that, uh, or if they're a quarter of an inch that they're um, perpendicular to the curb instead of parallel so that um, it can minimize tripping hazards. Um, and then in terms of sidewalk continuity and safety for people, pedestrians and um, other users of the sidewalk, we've been encouraging and requiring um, driveway access points to ramp up to, and across sidewalks instead of cutting driveways and cutting the sidewalk down. Um, and so these standards are written in um, to this ordinance as well. And that's it. Relative to this, because actually this pertains directly to me, that, that I live on a street that has no grass strip, has no separation. In fact, my, my driveway does cut and ramp down through the sidewalk, which is unfortunate and treacherous for people who are actually trying to traverse it, particularly when it's icy. We don't offer an alternative because it's not much. Um, with, without the, the grass strip to create that ramp, there's, mm -hmm. there's not much of an alternative. I mean, and we have quite a few streets that function like that. Right. So again, this is for a new, this would typically be for new construction or if you're doing, you're building, if you're asking for a new curb cut. Okay. Or if Department of Public Works goes in and rebuilds the street and it includes sidewalks, then right. this would be the standard to use. Any other questions relative to sidewalks? Is that it? That's it. Uh, Council Murphy. Well, not, I don't really have any questions about the sidewalk park, but the bicycle park. I, you know, I think I share Councilor's, Councilor Adams' feeling about this. I mean, essentially, what this ordinance does is say the traditional bike rack that is currently in front of the high school is obsolete, melt it down, get rid of it. That doesn't solve the problem anymore. <clears throat> I mean, if you have a school with 20 classrooms, that's 200 spaces. That's going to take 2,000 square feet of area if you have them every two and a half feet with eight feet here and there. I mean, it chews up a ton of space. I mean, bicycle storage as we think of it now, you know, is obsolete when you, when you put these standards for space and style in. It chews up an awful lot of space and is going to be very expensive to com accommodate. I mean, you know, a climate change analogy. I don't want to be considered a bicycle denier, but I think that this is kind of over the top a little bit um, when you think about the fact that what we're used to as bicycle racks are gone, and the space it would take to do this would be, I think, I think, is a little much. And some of the places you want to put these things in the setback, right now they'd be under four feet of snow. You wouldn't be able to get to them anyway. I mean, the nice red beach bar bicycle, you wouldn't even see. It would be totally buried. You know, so I think for a lot of the years, some of these things are going to be totally inaccessible anyways, even though we require them to build them. Um, I, I just think it's onerous, um, at least the bicycle part, portion of it is. And, you know, in five per classroom, and it, it just it seems a little over the top to me. I'm comfortable with the sidewalk standards because I think, you know, there's sound engineering and that's what's been going along, around for a long time. You know, but the, the bicycle thing, I think, is, is, is a tad over the top. And, and I mean, a, a bad idea doesn't become a good idea just because it doesn't apply to anything but new buildings. Eventually, it's going to apply to everything. You know, it's a standard. And once you codify something, it is the code, isn't it? And it's awfully hard to get people off of it. Councilor Spector. Well, just so we don't lump all of it into being onerous, you chose the example of the classroom, which had five. But if we got that chart up again and again, so classrooms, usually schools are built with quite a bit of space around them, and I would hope people as they're developing schools now would consider mm -hmm. the encouragement of bicycles. So that's just for the classroom, but let me just finish. But if you look at, again, if you go to a bar, a nightclub, restaurant, the Y, it's one per 1,000 square feet. And again, I use the example of a restaurant, you know, that may be three, four 
thousand square feet, five thousand square feet. Even that, you're talking about five bike spaces. So the one I would say that you pulled there, which was the classroom one, or the even the trade one of two per classroom, are the only ones that I would consider, you know, onerous. But again, these would be for, I don't think, for new buildings. And so if you're talking about a new school, again, I would hope that would be a school that had, that would have the space to do that. But the standard also requires it be a certain distance from the front door. You can't stick them wherever you happen to have room. They have to be there, which, which I think is also an issue. <clears throat> Council Schur. Um, when you say change of use, let's say a, a restaurant went in where Faces is now, would they, they would then be required to, to meet this? Um, except it doesn't apply in the Central Business District. Um, and, that, and the reason for that is because we, as a community, have potential for creating sort of more bike space in public, um, bike parking in public spaces, and we um, need to do a better job, frankly, of providing bike storage for the public, for the general public, <coughs> because it's sort of a communal space. There's an exception for central business. Okay. Thank you, sir. And if I could just go back to the old, the old-fashioned kind of bike rack. The reason why that's not a preferred rack anymore is because it doesn't hold as many bicycles. Um, because you can't really put that many bicycles, even though you have a long rack and, you, and it seems compact, you can't actually physically fit um, bicycles um, in every one of those little slots that are created. And, and it also requires you to lift your bicycle up and over to get the locks around. So there's a, there are several reasons why those bike racks are, have fallen out of favor. Um, so this future new school that we're going to build that would suddenly trigger this, of course, doesn't compel us at this point to take the bike racks that we currently have and scrap them and melt them down. Though those are still allowed because they're pre-existing systems. We're not building a new school in any time in the near future, and probably by the time we do secure funding for a new school, people won't be riding bikes, they'll be hovering or in some other fashion. But the fact is that, that the, the, I think the owner's description that you're describing, at least the <coughs> owner's circumstances relative to new school development, is really the most hypothetical aspect of this whole thing, with the exception of Smith College, of course, is possibly the one um, entity that was, is likely to develop new systems and buildings. And we, we have kind of a limited say over what they do within their campus anyway, uh, based on the Dover Amendment. But I don't know to what extent we have the authority to mandate that they they meet these conditions in terms of um, I think we bicycle would argue storage. That park, well, parking is clearly, parking for automobiles is clearly um, allowable to, to regulate. Um, and I would argue bicycle parking it falls under that same kind of category. So you can reasonably regulate schools. Um, and I think it's uh, one of the issues about Smith is we're, we're currently there under a um, uh, traffic demand management program now where they're encouraging their s faculty staff and students to be coming to school without cars so I don't a and they do um, um, I think they have been working on cr creating better facilities um, for students and bicycles so I don't I think f with every new building they build we would be looking at that number uh, Council O'Donnell um, I just would like to um, observe from what happened in the Transportation Parking Commission, you have a lot of people who are interested in, in bicycles as a mode of transportation. So I'm not surprised that many members push for increasing the number of bike racks. I think that makes sense. Um, what I haven't heard is on the other side, I haven't heard anyone push back and say this is too many. Um, so I guess when we talk about how onerous this is, I'm not, I'm not seeing the pushback except conceptually in this debate in the council. Um, I haven't heard it from businesses. I haven't heard it from certainly not any school or you know, anything like that. Um, so I would just make that observation. When we, when we think about what's onerous, we really have to um, ask the actual developers or people or builders who might find it onerous, and I haven't heard that. What I have heard is uh, from individuals who use bicycles as a mode of transportation now and in the future, this is a, this is a good idea. So. Councilor Mark. Oh. Well, I mean, 
I mean, I would just be a lot more comfortable with on a project by project basis, since we're primarily doing the construction, that the planning board asks the developer to estimate what they think the demand for bicycle storage is given the project, present that to the planning board, and let them make a determination if they think it's sufficient or not. I mean, clearly, if clearly if it's new construction and it's senior housing, they're going to be able to make a case for the fact that perhaps fewer of the people are going to be riding bicycles than if it's family housing for people with, with young children. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's, it's practical. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bicycle denier, so I'll be quiet. Council Ryan. I'm a bicyclist and a bicycle enthusiast, but if you ask a committee that's fraught with bicycle enthusiasts if they like the ordinance, of course they're going to say yes. <laughs> But also, I don't think there's been any other sort of outreach done otherwise. So I mean, I mean, it, it's a, no. I don't think we can tell from 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 transportation and parking and this council meeting what any developer would think or even other bicycle enthusiasts. So you know, I mean, I think all we have is the minutes of the transportation and parking committee uh, commission and this council. And 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 if we want to do more outreach, we should. Otherwise, I think there's very little to be deduced from just these two committees. That, but, but just on that point, I mean, that was exactly what I what I said. It shouldn't surprise us that mm -hmm. the Transportation and Park Commission asked for more. Um, it shouldn't surprise us also when we had the zoning revisions that we just had last year that the Energy and Sustainability Commission pushed for more stringent standards for our zoning. Um, but on that issue also, you know, perfectly public, uh, a public <coughs> issue, had many public meetings, many public meetings, um, and, and this is... Um, not quite on the same level, but certainly went before the planning board, um, uh, ordinance committee, transportation parking, and the city council. And I haven't heard people push back against these uh, requirements um, any more than I heard them push back against the energy and um, sustainability requirements. So that's just an observation. You know, I, I don't think we disagree on that point, but um, just something that I, I'm weighing when I think about this. Uh, Councilor Carney has not spoken um, yet. So. This is uh, an example of why it's good that we have two readings on issues. We have uh, the Gazette here, I see that Mr. Crowley is taking down notes on this, <laughs> probably most controversial uh, item on the agenda tonight. So I would well, imagine early yet. <laughs> <laughs> that given the press and the two weeks that we have, if mm -hmm. there is significant pushback or concern among uh, folks in the development community, then we'll hear about it by the next meeting. And I'm comfortable mm -hmm. voting. <coughs> With the understanding that if there's there's a lot of other public comment or opinions on the matter, we'll hear about them in the next two weeks or at the next council meeting. So, uh, Council Murphy, you were next, and then Council Adams, if you want. Mm -hmm. so. Well, you know, and I think we can always make the case. Well, we haven't heard any pushback, you know, but the general public really doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about bicycles in February when they've shoveled snow for three of the last five days. I mean, I, yes, the advocates for bicycle transportation are going to be aware of it because they're interested in it. But the general public as a whole is just hoping it stops snowing. You know, to what extent do they know? And again, I'm, I'm in favor of bicycle storage, but it seems a tad arbitrary. And I'd still be more comfortable with the planning board leaving it that on a project by project basis, that developer will make a case for what they feel the necessary storage is for whatever it is they're building or whatever it is they're changing. And the planning board can, on a case by case basis, decide whether it works for them or not, rather than setting <coughs> what I feel is kind of an arbitrary statute that then all of a sudden becomes, becomes gospel. I don't deny that. Bicycle storage is a good thing. I just think this is a little bit arbitrary for setting a standard when it could be reviewed project by project as it had been and, and still come up with a successful result. Council LaBarge has not spoken at this point Thank yet. So. I think um, Carolyn had stated that the process itself would be a heck of a lot better here with this standard point being put in place. So that way when developers come in, they know exactly what has to be done when they come to planning. So she distinctly stated that it would be easier for contractors or developers coming into planning, correct? Right. Because that standard is in place. Instead of not knowing 
and coming in and asking all kinds of questions in front of the planning board, it's there for them, correct? Right. Um, I, I think we already have a standard that the bicyclists have to be accommodated. Um, I think by going, I think by setting a standard whereby the um, applicant then has to prove or suggest that they don't need any bicycle mm -hmm. um, parking is going um, against what we already have is sort of taking a step backwards from where we are in the ordinance now where we're saying we need to accommodate all kinds of modes of transportation and it's not just with bike lanes but once you get to your destination and if you work at a senior housing um, facility you might only you might want to get there by bicycle or you might only be able to get there by bicycle it's not necessarily the people who live in those um, um, uh, buildings or facilities but it's all the employees who might need to access that um, we've had um, this the planning board has had this conversation with a number of applicants from office buildings to hotels and their first inclination is to focus on building the building and accommodate cars because that's what um, that's been the typical pattern and um, so they're not necessarily thinking about the other facilities for the people who might be actually using the buildings once they turn the keys over to the end user. And um, for example, we also have a standard where shower facilities are required over a certain size building um, for people who opt to come in other ways besides driving. And that sometimes comes as a surprise to um, applicants because they're not really thinking about the end user. They're thinking about building a building to, and accommodating with the standard. And then I just want to go back and just um, say that for the process, the planning board held an advertised public hearing. And as a separate pu advertised public hearing, ordinance committee had their um, hearing. So there were two separate hearings that were advertised for two weeks each on different days. Um, and it wasn't just parking and transportation. The planning board actually had quite a bit of detailed discussion about this chart and and suggested changes in fact the planning board members there was debate about how many uh, spaces were appropriate particularly for the schools and that's where they came up with a recommendation to drop and pull out the business and trades um, but they acknowledged and we have a planning board member who actually works at Smith they acknowledged that schools never seem to have enough bicycle parking um, for the demand so I think it wasn't just um, bicycle advocates from the Parking and Transportation Committee that, that looked at this and evaluated it. Councilor Schwecker, you Yeah, uh, Carol and Ant said a lot of the things I was going to say. One is that we already have a standard, and I was going to say we'd be going backwards. And again, if we're going to do this part of uh, kind of being forward thinking, we do this for cars. I mean, if you're going to say that about bikes, you could equally say that for cars. Why do we set such clear standards? We could say, let's leave it to the planning board. And I think you raised that earlier. Do we want the planning board to be the place? That's an interesting argument. We could. I would prefer that we have some. This seems a little more like a vision that we have, that it, it, and that's more holistic. I'd rather we did that, but there may be an argument for the planning board to do it. But I, I would certainly support this, and I agree. I think once it's in the paper that the council has voted on something, we'll see if we have especially some folks who are in the development community coming forward and saying, God, this is onerous. Um, uh, Councilor Klein is not spoken yet. I also want to say, just using this language, that this is going to be onerous for developers when <laughs> promoting bicycle use <laughs> is about promoting health, it's about reduction of pollution, it's about reduction of fossil fuel use, it's about all of these incredibly positive things that we want for our community. And so we have this opportunity to you know, in a small way, promote bicycle use, which I think is just about creating a livable community, a healthy community. And, you know, I just think it's out of scale to talk about the onerousness of this for developers when it's actually promoting this incredibly healthy and positive culture for our community. So I, I really want to support this and encourage my fellow counselors to support this. Councilor O'Donnell and then Councilor Adams. Thank you. Um, just to add a new perspective to this, um, first of all, I think the debate on this has been really good, and I think it's good that we are not just rubber stamping one number but having a, a serious debate about it, so I'm thankful for that. Um, but I hope the logic that we're applying in this case does not hold true for the other 
zoning ordinance that we're going to look at tonight, which is about stormwater uh, requirements for new projects. Um, I don't want to skip ahead, but it's, it requires a comprehensive analysis of stormwater. Could that be burdensome to a developer? Sure. But it's the right thing to do, and it's better than no standard. We can be against 10 spaces per classroom. We can be against five spaces per classroom, one space per classroom. But we can't be against any standard whatsoever, in, in my opinion. Councilor Adams. Um, bicycling is very important for various reasons, including health reasons. I'm a bicyclist. And um, there should be a standard, but it should be based on actual need. As acknowledged, this is not based on actual need. It's, 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 it's to an extent made up, to quote what Ms. Mish said. And um, if it were based on actual need, I, I, I would support it. But it's not. It's arbitrary, and, and because of that, I don't support it. Thank you. Um, Councilman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, developer sort of has an evil connotation to it or has been using property owner. Let's say property owner, not developer, not someone doing for profit but a property owner that wishes to do something on their property, I think they may find it onerous. Not, not somebody building a shopping mall, but simply somebody, a family-owned business trying to do something. Rich Cooper trying to do something. Um, not a developer, a grocer. Not a developer, you know, somebody that runs a small retail establishment that's doing a change, I think would find this uh, a complex thing to deal with. May I ask that we separate this and be able to vote on sidewalks separately from bicycles. We can we can separate those. Yep. Yes, and uh, I'm going to take I'm going to take the chair's prerogative at this point to speak at this point, and then um, I think it, we it becomes problematic when you conflate something like Cooper's and a smaller enterprise would be obliged to provide one parking space for bicycle. One point, in fact, actually they already provide multiple spaces mm -hmm. for bicycles, and that's that's I don't think that's necessarily a clear discussion. The other issue that concerns me is. A developer, and this is not ascribing evil intent on them, but their purpose is to maximize their space for profit. It is not to promote the use of bicycles. This is where the community basically projects in, in planning and zoning. This is the way we project our hopes and aspirations. And I think, as Councilor Klein said, it's an aspirant. It's not so much, it's not necessarily predicated on on a, a, a census and an inventory of need. It's based on trying to, as well as to promote and create a culture of using bicycles. And particularly when we're speaking the term owners, we keep bringing up the issue about the, the requirement of schools. Now, as I said, this only applies to one school if we really parse it down. If, 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 if it, well, with any major retrofit or that goes to any of our new schools, of course, as well. But that's actually, it's already been our described ethos to provide as much, uh, to promote biking as much as possible. And I don't think that's up to us, because then in that case, we're the developer. And if we think that we as a community, that that's too onerous, then that's a different issue. But as far as Smith, the, the biggest conflict, and I think Councilor Spector will speak to this, that occurs at Smith is relative to car usage is not bicycle usage and if if we have some influence on Smith and their development as far as providing more opportunities and options for bicyclists it seems to make sense I, I understand the reluctance based on the perceived arbitrariness of it but essentially I think built into these numbers at least that has been vetted through the various committees was the description of as I said Councilor Klein said the aspiration and the promotion of the system to try and encourage more bike usage and reduce car usage and that's actually Smith that's actually part of Smith's philosophy at least as they've presented it to us that they have they have the desire to do that as well and this this would conform to it we do have any number of things that we actually prescribe that could be argued as being arbitrary for development. When we have this debate on King Street and how development would occur there, uh, we know that most developers would much prefer their parking up front, would prefer to have a simple box, would prefer not to provide green screens, prefer not to provide open space. That would be their preference. It would, and some have argued that it's too onerous to provide to subsidize parking systems that might uh, that their uh, systems may impact. Um, 
honestly, any project that fails on the strength of having too many bicycle spaces is a very fragile pro uh, uh, project, I would imagine. They would probably fail, they would probably run away from uh, stormwater review. They would probably run away from setback regulations. They would probably run away from uh, parking requirements and inventory and or building requirements. Parking, I have a feeling, would be the lowest tempered point that would create a crisis. That said, I mean, I, I understand the objections. I acknowledge and, and, and actually think they're reasonable objections. But at the same time, I don't think they're, for me, they're not objections that actually hold enough water to make me consider otherwise on this point. And <clears throat> Councilor Murphy. Can I request equal time? <laughs> um, I think I haven't quite come up to your par, but yes, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, we're making the assumption that when people create buildings, that they do it in a vacuum. You know, <coughs> if someone creates a building and they have a target audience they want to have go to that building, and the people that they want to drive that draw to that building they feel are going to come on bicycles, then it's going to be their intent to accommodate those people. That's why I make a case for the fact that let the developer make a case to the planning board as to how many spaces they think they may need based on the use they intend for the building, the people they think they're going to draw to the building, and if they feel those people are going to come on bicycles, of course they're going to want to accommodate them. We make the assumption you know, this assumption of evilness in people building things, that they want to do it as cheaply as possible, and that they don't respect the fact that they want to draw people there, that they're not going to contemplate how the people are going to get there, and that they won't accommodate their parking their car, they're parking their bicycle, they're parking their drone, their pogo stick, their camel, whatever they come on. I mean, the process of creating a building that will, that will make this go into play in a major way are making a major investment and they're not going to cut off trying to serve any population um, that they may want to get there. They get, I'm getting that climate denier look again from over here. But anyways, that, that's my position. That people, that, that people should be able to make a case when they put their development plan up, how much they think they need based on the use of their building and who they think is going to come there. Well, and to me, that's reasonable rather you, than setting an arbitrary standard. You've, you've, and since you're speaking to me, I'll address it. Oh, you've, yeah. you've made my point, actually. Um, we, we actually, while we do want development, we want actually, we want some influence of development and how that is affected. And that's why we have zoning and that's why we have a planning board. It's for that precise reason. And so that we can reconcile their ambitions and our needs. And, and, I, and to that end, I think that this is the happy, weird, confusing medium that we, we settle on. I, I, allowing developers to have their head and basically have them come present and tell us what they want and we go, well, okay, we don't really have rules relative to that. We would like you to promote more bike usage, even though you think that most of your customers are gonna come in Humvees not pogo sticks, that, that we actually want to discourage Humvee uses and want to encourage more pogo sticks. And in, in so far, that's our job. That's our job. I mean, that's why we have these standards. This is why we create these conditions. And there is a tipping point, and this is the argument, and I think to Councilor O'Donnell's point, this is a great debate to have, although it, we're probably killing people with boredom, but it's, it is, <laughs> this has value because what it describes is, is I, I really glad for the divided discussion on it because it really does, this is us struggling with trying to find that fine balance point that makes sense where it isn't, where it doesn't discourage development, mm -hmm. yet at the same time promotes our aspirations. That's what it is. And, I, it, and, and as I said, honestly, I really think the tipping point for most developers is not going to be a bike rack. I'd really be surprised if it is that developer really had a really low threshold of pain. So, so that, but I understand that cumulatively, yes. all these things can look more burdensome. And that I do understand and appreciate. And I think, I think this is the struggle we're having right now. I think this is what inspires Councilor Adams' concerns and your concerns as well. And, and right now, to be honest, I don't think we have and I think we squeezed the juice out of this. So I think that, that it might be appropriate. Your call was for the separation of the vote, and I think that's appropriate as well. 
So if we, um, if the council's fine, I'd like to call the question. They're yeah. agreed on that. Yeah. Uh, Council Riley? No, if you could just clarify the split. The split is is uh, first up. We'll dis we will vote on the uh, ordinance pertaining to the bicycle facilities, uh, and then after that, the second part would be the, the sidewalk. The sidewalk, sidewalk facilities, or also as known as pedestrian facilities, on this side. Council O'Donnell. Um, I, I have an amendment to offer. To, uh, to which one? To the bicycle. Um, and that's essentially what's printed here in the table does not match what we see. Um, and the, the use and, and bicycle parking requirement table on the second page, okay. yeah, which is that. Um, and the specific, specific thing that has to be changed is in the, um, the fourth row, K-12 school, college, and, and, and so on, mm -hmm. we need to remove the words business, trade, or industrial school and put it in because it, it, apply, it already is written Okay. Two rows down, okay. and then for fun, we might as well capitalize the word business. Okay, so you're calling for the deletion on column four on the usage, on the use table, uh, to remove business trade or industrial school. Correct. It's correct on the on the PowerPoint. On the PowerPoint, right? but on our not in the, the, on our yeah. document. Yes. So I, so I assume like we're going off the printed version. Script nurse, 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 script nurse error. The one that's on the screen. Well, we'll that's what. It, so. No, that, that's, that's just that's, that's what Carolyn. Carolyn, Carolyn just gave oh. to her. Oh, okay, I see. I propose we synchronize. Second. Well, no, what you have here <clears throat> is correct. What the, where it says here, actually, you have the deletion here as well. Huh? Okay. So on her document, hers is correct. She's fine. Okay. The one that we have the one that's been submitted. Okay. Okay. As long as one that's being the same, yeah. Correct and amended. So that deletion, right. there is that sure, strikeout. What's that? But the one that you have there actually reads correctly. That's classroom, different. Classroom, laboratory, yeah. other teaching areas. So if it's like a laboratory that's doing blood draws, <laughs> it seems so arbitrary. So this is the one, right Carolyn, that came to us after rules. It came yeah. out of rules. So. Yeah, the one that went through ordinance had the separated line item for business, trade, or industrial school as its own category with a breakdown of two per classroom versus five for the other schools. <coughs> So that came out of planning board and ordinance committee. Mm -hmm. oh. The one that I uploaded here, Carolyn, For is the assembly. one that you sent me after the rules meeting. So, and I printed that out here and I have it. it you know, it shows up in two lines. One of them is a deletion and one of them is an addition. So whatever it is, the I, I mean, the one that I printed that I sent you has it, so I don't know. So what she, has, she has that document here with, with the strikeout. So we got the right one. So we the addition, have the but we just don't have it on our on so our so agenda. So. so we're all set on it. I have a suggestion then, Mr. Chairman. We could easily just vote on that right now to make sure that okay. that amendment also passes and then we, we can clear that. So up. the amendment is to change what you already have reflected on that document, even though so. so we just vote on it. No, she doesn't. She's saying she doesn't. That's it. Right. Well, what I'm saying is this, this one actually is correct. If we make an amendment that would correspond with that, then this would be correct as well. So I'm just saying that you can use this for reference, not the final question. Okay, all right. All right, so the amendment is to reflect the strikeout of those items and then as they're presented here in the bottom on ours. I should just for another. There's also in that same section um, laboratory is named, which seems a wee bit arbitrary. I think the idea was that it was a laboratory for teaching purposes, but I think it can be interpreted to be a number of other things. Where Research laboratories. And, all kinds of things. Research laboratory. and so I'm just wondering if it's really necessary to include that word. I'm wondering what the thinking behind that term being in there was. Um, well, it's meant for teaching labs within a school setting, so we want to, we want to so there's, so it's very clear that it's not just sort of your standard lecture classroom. 
but a classroom that's also a lab. But then you're going to have like hospitals and medical facilities and things Those like are that. Those are under that number one. Laboratories being somehow included. Um, I think that's under, well, you can, um, if you feel like you need to clarify that by saying classroom labs, that's fine. Um, the idea, I think if we go back to the um, retail section, or the um, there's hospital other medical uses is in the other category. Yeah. Um, Does it have a different though? requirement though? That's the. But, Councilor, it says other it, teaching. Other it, teaching it, the implication is. It's a classroom teaching area, laboratory teaching area, and other teaching yeah. areas. I think it can be equivocal. It's not. I mean, it's oh, it's a small. We point. already have yes. a, we already have a reference to medical two lines up, and similarly it says um, other medical uses. Um, if we were going to talk about laboratory as a medical use, we would have included it there. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it seems clear. What would you suggest to clarify? I. I mean, I can't imagine that laboratories are going to be separate from the school facilities anyway, so it just seems like a, it's not a needed term in that. So you would strike just it, striking just it. Strike it because of its uh, potential confusion? Unless it feels extremely important to your office. And Carolyn, can you speak at the microphone, please? Uh, I believe the reason it's there is to um, make sure that it's clear that those um, are considered classrooms as well. So I think that, um, you know, I suppose that if it says any other teaching areas and you kept that, then that probably covers it. Um, I think this was just trying to be very specific. So I, I'm fine if you want to strike laboratory now that I'm looking at this sort of in total because I would consider that a, class, um, a teaching area. First of all, is that uh, your amendment, Counselor? Yes. Is second to that? that two amendments. Two amendments. So well, there's two am amendments. Can we deal standing, with this so. amendment first? Well, yeah, hang on a second. Can I make down. a suggestion? I would consider it a friendly modification of this amendment if we just, it may be redundant, but we can do it anyway, stick the word classroom <laughs> again in front of laboratory to make it clear it's a certain kind of laboratory. Classroom, I mean, it, comma, classroom laboratory. Yeah. Comma. Not, not to belabor this any <laughs> further, but I mean, it, what if it was a, a, a laboratory in a school that's used for research but is not ever used as a classroom or as a t it's, it's a lab where someone goes in to do lab work but never there's never teaching that happens in it the, to the amendment it Councilor Murphy. It to the amendment it is clearly our desire to plant bicycle spaces all over the place so at this point to quote a famous national politician at this point does it really matter I just remember when E.T. escaped the laboratory on a bicycle. <laughs> I think, oh, God, let's not get into flying bicycles now. I would call the question. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, there are amendments. Yeah, let, let me, let me, let me, let me let, hang on a second, please. Let me recite the amendments yes. that are proposed right now. We're, there is a strike. Uh, we're striking from this, as I understand it, we're striking from this the uh, uh, business, trade, or industrial school. That's being struck. Classroom laboratory is remaining. We remove the comma after classroom. Yes. And no? No, because you need classroom well, itself. Just add no, another classroom. You just add right. there is classroom twice. Classroom, comma, classroom laboratory, comma, and other teaching areas. Fine. That's, that's, so. Modify. It now reads K through 12 school, comma, college, comma, uh, classroom, comma, Labor uh, classroom laboratory comma yep. and other teaching areas. I just ask if I might if that if that uh, clears up the confusion for the council of crime or compounds it. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's necessary personally, but, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but so it, then therefore <laughs> then it's no longer confusing. To those amendments. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the amendments, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Uh, so now we're back to the separated order on bicycles. Is there? Yeah, it's hard to imagine, right? So to that first section, I will ask for the secretary to call the roll, please. And I know, and you have oh. part. You have to separate this now.
bicycles. Yeah. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. No. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Yes. Councilor Adams. No. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. So it passes in first reading. It will be uh, subject to second reading at our next meeting. So now we come to the pedestrian safety section. Uh, sidewalks, otherwise. Uh, any further discussion on that item? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Okay. That passes, and we'll also, uh, in first reading, unanimously, and will be available for vote at the next. Uh, next up, we have um, the ordinance to amend code section 312-102, schedule one. New South Street. This comes with a positive recommendation from the Transportation and Parking, uh, and also positive recommendation from the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. Is this is um, its first reading? And speaking of reading, would you like me to read the order? I would waive reading. Um, it's a it's a short one, yeah. so I mean. I mean, in the interest of public understanding, so yeah. that uh, this is uh, an ordinance of the city of North. And this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. This is uh, an ordinance of the city of Northampton, providing that the code of ordinances of the city of Northampton be amended by revising section 312-102 of said code, and is providing for repealing prohibited parking on New South Street, and be it ordained by the city council and city of Northampton city council assembled. As follows, the table contained in section <coughs> 2, schedule 1, prohibited at all times, is amended by deleting the following. Um, New South Street, westerly, uh, from point 253 feet southerly from Main Street to the point 275 feet southerly from Main Street. Uh, first, I'll accept a motion. So moved. Could we have the uh, chair of traffic and transportation put that in simple English for us as to what we're doing? Sure. Where, where the crosswalk was moved, um, the Academy of Music, um, this is a replacement of a parking space. Yeah. Councilor uh, O'Donnell. So, um, so what we're looking at by doing this, possibly what we're gaining one or two more? Uh, looks like one. Places. One. one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the year here correct? Should it be 15? Mm -hmm. I think it might have. Or was it originated in 14 and it stays 14? Yeah. I think so. Yeah? Yeah, I introduced it last year. Yeah, yeah. We're, a little, we're a little last late. Year. Yeah. So that's the introductory point. It goes into effect upon a pond. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's an antique. <laughs> so it's, it's actually uh, point 253 to point 275. It is um, 22 feet, which is the standard for. Okay. Size of a parklet. <laughs> Two parklets. Bicycle actually. parking space. We're in discussion. Um, so this repeals prohibited parking now. And what is. Then what? What does that mean? And it creates a parking space. And creates. It creates a parking space. Thank you. The crosswalk. The change of the crosswalk. Council Murphy. No. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Council Murphy. Yes. Council O'Donnell. Yes. Council Sherry. Yes. Council Spector. Yes. Council Adams. Yes. Council Carney. Yes. Council White. Yes. Council Klein. Yes. <coughs> yes. Uh, that passes in first reading. Now we come up to something that's particularly relevant and has been cited a couple of times tonight already. Would it be possible to ask the council for two readings on this? Only because we've this crosswalk has been eliminated now for um, about six months, and um, one of the reasons we would like to have a car park there would be to discourage people who still want to step onto the curb in the old Phantom crosswalk. So, yeah. I mean, it's the it's the parking situation that's been there for many many months, and. Um, so anyway, I just would ask you to consider okay. that. Just move to suspend rules. Second. 
Okay, the motions have been made to, uh, made to suspend Rule 14 for second reading to occur tonight, and it's been seconded. Any discussion on the suspension of rules? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> Move second reading. Second. For the discussion. Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labar? Yes. Yes. Okay. Councilor Murphy? <laughs> Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, it, that passes in second reading and is no law. Um, Next up, as I said, this is my precursor to this is for referral, but it should be noted this has come up a lot and there's some discussion of this in public comment, so I think it's appropriate to actually read it before I actually we send it off for referral. Um, this is upon the recommendation of, uh, I'm sorry? That's what we're working on right now. That was my preamble. Yeah, we're on for first reading. It's not for referral? It's not for first reading. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's first reading. My bad. Right, right, right. Then it's very appropriate that. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising section number 40-5 of said code, providing for list of enforcing officers and penalties for non-criminal disposition uh, be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton. Uh, that the list of following enforcement officers and penalties for non-criminal disposition you add as follows under chapter uh, <coughs> and uh, chapter 285 <coughs> section 17 the officers for enforcement are the Department of Public Works director or his or her designee uh, chief of police or his or her designee or parking enforcement officers and the penalty schedule is first violation of $50 second violation same event, $100. Subsequent same event violations would be $250. I'll accept a motion to put that on the floor. So moved. I, I second. There's a second for purposes of discussion, then Council I, I, I move we take this ordinance together with the other companion ordinance. I think that would make sense. Is, is everyone okay with that? Which I will, I mean, it does make sense. We just defined enforcement officers, but we didn't define enforcement officers for what? And makes sense. okay, uh, this is this is also upon the recommendation <coughs> of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, an ordinance of the city of Northampton. Um, this is for snow and ice on sidewalks, removal by owner or occupant required, removal by the city. Um, and it's called for a deletion of the entire uh, um, chapter 285, section 17, and replace it with the following. <laughs> Removal in snow and ice from sidewalks. A, the owner res responsible for a building, structure, or lot of land bordering on any street, lane, court, square, or public place within the city where there is a sidewalk, including any curb, ramp cut, shall, after snow has ceased to fall thereupon, and whenever snow shall have collected or deposited upon any sidewalk within 24 hours, remove the same or cause the same to be removed from such sidewalk and also remove or cause to be removed from such sidewalk or cover or cause to be covered with sand or some other suitable substance within 24 hours after it has been formed or appeared any ice with which the same may be encumbered in such a way as to render such sidewalk safe and convenient for travel to the full width for property located in the central business district or in areas of Florence zoned general business as delineated on the Northampton zoning map. The above requirements must be met within 24 hours or by 8 a.m. on the next business day, whichever is sooner. If a person is found to be violating the provisions of this section, it shall be the duty of the chief of police or his or her designee, the director of public work or, or his or her designee or parking enforcement officers to assess a fine to any such person in accordance with the fine schedule set forth in Chapter 40 entitled Non-Criminal Enforcement, each 24-hour period of, of violation of subscription A or B exists shall be considered to constitute a separate offense. B, no person shall place, deposit, or move ice or snow onto the paved surface of a street or onto a gravel shoulder area, if any. C, upon neglect of or violation of the duties imposed by these provisions, 
of subsections A and B of Chapter 285, Section 17, such duties may be performed by the Director of Public Works or his or her designee at the expense of the person or persons or entities liable to perform those duties. Assessment of costs under this subsection shall not preclude any party from being fined under Chapter 40, uh, Section 5. So I'll accept the motion for both. So moved. Second. 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 Okay. And discussion. Councilor Adams. Uh, it's important to note that the, the duty is on the owner, <laughs> even though that may play out uh, in practice differently, and it also may be that duty may, um, by you know, by lease obligations, fall onto the tenant, um, the tenant themselves. Um, I think one of the most important things about this ordinance is it now adds for, uh, and now allows for enforcement by different entities. Parking enforcement officers <coughs> and public works. I believe both of those were new. I believe the past versions. It was it was only the police department, I, and I know that's extremely important to the business community because the things people you know everyone's wondering about how how it gets enforced. Um, and that's all for now. Thanks. The the other actual important feature of this is it's taking something that's formerly a criminal citation, which is what it is currently, mm -hmm. and converting it to a non-criminal citation, which also inspired part of the reluctance on the part of enforcement because it's something you would have to go to appeal in yeah. court of law. And this actually allows and gives the flexibility for quicker responsiveness and more, uh, an inclination from the, in, the uh, empowered officers to actually cite or at least to warn. And um, so thereby enhances and improves it and also allies, uh, allows for a, 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 a easier line of appeal. Councilor Murphy. Mm -hmm. Did you read the fines? Because they're in there somewhere, and I don't recall hearing them. Yes, yeah. I read. First violation, $50. Second violation, same event, $100. Subsequent violation, same event, $250. Right, so that would mean um, if you came into compliance and then another storm came along, you'd start over again. It'd be yeah. Just so people understand, understand yes. that. So That's my understanding. It snows Monday. I don't do it till Wednesday. But I do it. When it snows the next Wednesday, I start over again. That's yeah. how then, we shovel snow. Yeah, and then, okay. And then just a question for the mayor. We now have three enforcing entities. How are they going to keep track of, you know, did a parking enforcement officer write the first one? Does the police officer that writes the second one, how do they know about the first we're, one? We're going to work on that internally. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work on making sure we coordinate that internally. <laughs> I mean, I think the police will be the first line, um, but we'll work on integrating those systems to make it happen. So I know that that's been a concern, um, and uh, it's even been a concern and discussed a little bit internally, but I'd rather have the option for more agencies being able to enforce it than less, and we can work out the logistics of that. No. I, I do want to add, though, that um, <laughs> as the sponsor of this amendment, that th there has been an amendment to my original uh, ordinance so just I wanted to be clear about that the the um, I mean I, and I actually have discussed it with counselors at ordinance I support the changes that were made um, to the first uh, to 285 17 that's fine uh, the changes to the fee schedule I'm I guess I'm a little more less clear about because uh -huh. I do think it changes the nature of it to have it be by snow event uh, mm -hmm. That is a change that was made in ordinance committee. So I guess I'd want to. I guess I just would raise that. I'd want to understand what that, why that's in there. So, uh, Council of the Barge, Council Shara, Council O'Donnell, and then Council Murphy. Um, Mayor, I got a call from uh, Mr. Nidell on Ryan Road today, reading about the ordinance change, and he does do his sidewalks very faithfully but we have had a serious drainage problem on Ryan Road, which I know you know about because we've had the Board of Public Works on site with me, and, um, and the concerns of how they do do the full width of their sidewalk and the idels and so forth. Because of the drainage problems and the water, and it becomes icy, I had to tell him at least put sand on it, even though after he has already shoveled it and so forth, because he was afraid about all of a sudden somebody knocking on his door and fining him. Mm -hmm. So how do you solve that problem when there are problems on sidewalks with drainage 
and people are plowing their I mean, sidewalks. I think, we, I think we would have to, I, I, you know, it would be a, you'd have to look at it on a case by case basis. And in this case, where you've got this other mitigating circumstance, but they're still trying to clear it and sand it, I think that would be, um, okay. I think the, the officer would have to take that into consideration. Okay. So, well, I don't, so, too, I don't see, I, no. Mr. Estes, who called me, because Bill and I, and Bobby, we had done the first original ordinance on this, and it's coming along great, is the last big storm that we had, Mr. Esty was out there using his snowblower, doing his sidewalk, which I did talk to Ned about this. He had great <clears throat> concerns, Mr. Estes did. The plow was coming out of Hickory Drive, and there is a curb cup within that area and it was already done and the plow went and all the snow went back on the sidewalk plus the curb cut and people are just not going to constantly keep going overwork and overwork so we got to work something out here of once the plows come in and the curb cuts are already done by the resident within that 24 hours they're doing it over again yeah that, then, gets, yeah, that gets a little trickier because it's very difficult to verify that part of it. Um, I mean, I know that the, the but it's caused crews, the problem. Yeah, but I, but there's even I mean, there's even case law about the fact that um, they, they you still have to the liability still exists for the homeowner and you still have to clear it even if a plow uh, throws it back onto your sidewalk. So I realize that's frustrating for people. I mean, it I, my driveway gets plowed back in. Um, Our all stuff's the time. Too, but I'm talking about uh, a sidewalk with curb cuts. Yeah, but I think um, I think we, that those are situations like that where we obviously want to have the highway superintendent take a look at it and see okay. what what can be done to modify it. Yeah. But on its face, I have to be clear: the ordinance requires the sidewalk to be kept clear by the property owner. We understand that yeah. there was concerns yeah. with a resident on it. Yep. Who also was part of doing the original yep. sidewalk I ordinance. It's a very devout. And uh, also, sidewalk. too, with the plow, which I talked with Ned about and Richard Pasoletti, was coming out of another street and pushing the snow up on the city tree belt onto the sidewalk. So, how do you solve these problems here? Well, I, I should note that what we are actually voting on. I understand that, but I'm just letting I mean, the mayor know, Councillor, okay, that people have called me about complaints about this. Thank you, Councillor. I understand and acknowledge and <laughs> note that for the public and then for anyone else who has a question about this, what we are doing is expanding enforcement officers who are, who have, <coughs> when issuing a citation, have discretionary power. They can take into consideration the <coughs> particular challenges that are presented, the unique challenges and determine whether it's appropriate to cite or at least warn or caution somebody so that th because as we all agree the objective is to create the clearest safest passage for pedestrians and people who are or who are uh, in wheelchairs or on crutches people in strollers the original intent of the rule that we developed so th to that end we're just expanding enforcement and reducing and, and modifying it so it's no longer criminal citations so and I think the issues that you bring up are certainly ones that we bring up in the event that they do get cited. They haven't been cited yet. I understand their concerns, but if they do get cited, then that's an opportunity <coughs> to, to deal with it. And Councillor uh, Carney. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm just very concerned. I, I mean, I support this entirely. I'm just, the, the reason I'm really concerned is that presently, probably only 1% of residents clear the sidewalk to the entire, to the full length, mm -hmm. to the full width. I mean, do typically most sidewalks are cleared a shovel's width, which is obviously inadequate for anybody in a wheelchair or anything else. I know in, in my neighborhood, there are only two residents, and one of them is the council president whose mm -hmm. sidewalk is cleared to the, its, its full width. So um, I'm concerned that when this is goes into effect at our second reading, there are enormous there are snow banks of, across the city exactly. that are now frozen, that are massive snow banks, and every resident will be required um, or will be to move those snow banks from where they exist on the sidewalk, lift them up, and put them into their yard, which is where they belong. Well, they're currently the required. It should, it should be I understand. I understand yeah. that. But what I'm I understand that. But I'm, what I'm saying is that 98 percent 
of the residents of the city of Northampton will be fined $50. Um, effective effective uh, at our next council meeting if, I mean April 2nd I mean it could be that yeah. they'll melt it could be that it could be that it'll melt and these will all be gone but if not on April say is that our next meeting oh we have one sooner we have one okay so on March 19th it's not very likely that those snow banks will be melted down and essentially 98% of the residents of the city of Northampton will be or should be if we pass this and we're sticking to it and we're actually enforcing it, receive a fifty dollar fine. So I'm I'm just concerned about the logistics and how this is gonna how this they, is gonna play out. By the, letter, the by the letter of the law they could receive a fine. It's a discretionary thing. There are a lot of things that people can receive all kinds of fines for and are not. The fact that this has been a particular, what did somebody say, this is a winter of one in 200 years, I think is one thing that gets taken into account, that there is nowhere to even put the snow, as somebody said earlier, um, was talking, can get taken into account. It also becomes much easier to challenge, like challenging a parking ticket um, at times. You can go in and challenge it, but you can say, look, this is what happened. And I've see, I, I was there just the other day, and I saw somebody challenging a parking ticket, and in fact, you know, they're taking that into account. So you can challenge it much easier. It's, we already had it as a, what, what you're saying then is we had a criminal, we would have arrested 90% yeah. well, no. of the citizens. <laughs> and that would have been in jail. What I, if I can clarify, what I was saying is that I, I'm concerned if we're not going to be um, um, kind of uh, consistent about this matter across the board. I'm, I'm concerned if some people get a ticket and some people don't get a ticket, when the fact is that there are very, very, very few residents who comply with the law presently. And so when we have a situation where the, not only the vast majority, I mean nearly, I would say 98 percent, really, of the right, I think that most people don't realize that the law is to remove all the snow from the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I think people are under the impression that if they shovel a width's worth and they clear a space to walk in the sidewalk that they've complied with the law. So and most, I would say, again, 98% of the people real, and uh, ignorance is not, is, is no excuse. I understand all that. I just, and I know that you're saying it's a discretionary matter, but I mean, is it, isn't it? I mean, who, who gets the ticket and who doesn't? I mean, it should be, we should have maybe give a, a, a moratorium for this year maybe or something. I mean, it, well, rather than to, just. As to your question of who gets yeah. the ticket is now under this new rule, and not the previous rule, it is the property <coughs> Is the owner of record who is ultimately liable in this circumstance? So if it's if it's no 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 if we, uh, you're not here. What I'm saying is I, no. I, 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 it's, it's a matter of discretion. So I, some people will get a ticket. I got, some I got, people won't. I got you, Councilor. Okay. I got okay. you. And Two things. One, I do have a question. I want to address you specifically in a second. But Councilor, you know the old ordinance was the same language in the old ordinance yeah. in terms of width of the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that in the past, That's not what new. we were saying, oh, we better be consistent. We better arrest everybody. But the well, under, it wasn't an arrestable offense, I, by the way. I should just be clear, so we don't want but to but hyperbole. It would have been much more difficult. Right. So the other question, the, what I think you're court. addressing here is actually how will this be I implemented in terms of policy? Because we have a lot of, there, there are other things like this where they do, there is some discretion. And I think that's like more a supervisory thing. So there's, <laughs> what's that? Like shooting dogs more off leash. Well, yeah. So, okay. Let's stay on so point. I think yeah. that, not really important. I think that we can point. get into a lengthy <laughs> discussion <laughs> and oh, on that language, but I think this is, I know, I hate this becomes how are the, the agencies now in charge of this going to look at this? What is the directive going to be from the mayor in terms of this? And so that there is consistency of policy. I think that's what you're asking for. And everyone is treated fairly. And I oh, think that's sure. up to the, you know, up to the, how this policy is put into effect. Council Chair. Sure. to my question that I had a while ago, which was, um, if someone wants to make a complaint, um, have we figured out where they <coughs> that? Police department. About an unshoveled sidewalk? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Probably the police would be the best place. Okay. Actually, also, there's a web the dispatch would be the, there's on, on the website, there's, there's now an opportunity a, for, there's an app you can use oh, on the yeah, website, yeah, torque, but that's the which way. goes to dispatch. Yeah. Okay, so it goes to dispatch. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so that dispatch would, uh, would deal with it at that point. I'm not telling people to call 911 about a shovel <laughs> sidewalk. I'm just saying <laughs> that, that the emergency communication center are the, are the one that route those complaints that people call. Like when you call the business line of the police department, you're going to talk to a, 
uh, you know, a dispatcher who's then going to route that to an officer. So. And so would they be routing them to the officers or to parking? Probably an officer, but I mean, the officers and the PEOs are all on the same radio frequency okay. and they talk all the time and PEOs request police officers and vice versa so they can, they communicate with each other. So, um, and even the DPW is on a, on a similar radio channel. So, um, yeah, I think, I, I mean, again, just to, from my perspective, part of what spurred this look for me was when the, um, when the bid decision came down and I had a big meeting with downtown stakeholders and I got lots of questions from people about the snow, who's going to deal with it, what's the ordinance, you know, um, and the ordinance we had before was a little bit unclear and it actually um, was unclear whether it was the property owner or whether it was a tenant or who, you know, who was actually responsible. And then we had this whole other issue of the, you know, the having to, the cumbersomeness of having to file a $50 criminal complaint. Um, and so that's what spurred looking at this and, and trying to make, make it clearer and make it make more sense. Um, and then trying to spread out the, you know, obviously for downtown, you know, having the PEOs who are out patrolling downtown looking for, you know, um, you know, handicapped parking violations, you know, parking in, in other area violations, this would be an easier thing for them to be able to observe. So, um, so that, that was the, that was the impetus for this. It was not, um, you know, it was not, and also we do get complaints. And so we wanted to be, have a more effective way to respond. I also think that by having it be, um, sort of having progressive discipline or progressive fines that for some of our habitual offenders, that it, it would, you know, we, we have had some offenders who just, you know, offend, you know, take, you know, we mail them the, we mail them the fine, we mail them the ticket, um, and they just kind of like keep going along, going along. Um, and so I think by ratcheting it, it up, that that will, um, you know, make it more, create more of an incentive for them to comply. So are you concerned that changing the, the how those fines are, um, the structure of it, it is not going to solve that? problem that you're talking about? That, okay. I am a little concerned about that part of it because the original, my original ordinance just said $50 for the first offense, $100, and then $250. Um, now it's, now it makes the second and third offense per event. Right. So, um, so theoretically, you know, you could have a habitual offender who just always waits until the second 48 hours. Um, and just get, takes their $50 fine and just, you know, keeps going along. And they're always just going to get a $50 fine. So it does kind of defeat the purpose if you're trying to go after the habitual offenders. Um, so that, that, that does change a little bit. So I, I, I wasn't at the ordinance committee, so I don't know the, the, the rationale for that. Council O'Donnell and then Council Murphy. That, that was the point I wanted to kind of return to, um, unless we want to discuss... <coughs> how it's going to be enforced a little more. But I, I guess I would also remark that, um, I mean, it's, this is a tool, I think, that various agencies can use to try and get the, the, the sidewalks clear. But it, there's no ordinance we can pass that will obviously solve the entire problem. And there'll be imperfections with anything. But this is a big improvement. Um, but on the point that the, the mayor brought up, um, we did change this in, in, in ordinance. Um, but it, it was subject of, the subject of some discussion. And I think we sort of decided that we couldn't decide and we, the council ought to debate it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'd like to do um, because I think the word same event is, um, is actually kind of unclear. I'm not sure what it means. Does it mean the same snowstorm? And if so, I don't know who's going to get three tickets in the, in the space of one snowstorm. My opinion is it should be um, for the same season and then we define season somehow. So that maybe it does reset next year, but I mean, if you know, one month you don't shovel, then the next month you don't shovel, then the next month you don't shovel, that would seem to be an appropriate use of the escalating fine, uh, in my opinion. So that's my comment. I think the reason that we talked about it as ordinance is that I'm really good with my sidewalk. And I take my kid to Disney during their February vacation, and I get the <coughs> two days in a row because I'm not there and I can make arrangements. So now I'm at, level, you know, Death Con 3, I'm getting $150, $250 tickets. Well, for the rest of the season, I'm good about it, but should I miss one period, I, I'm still at that level? It seems a little unfair. I mean, if you, after you get your $50 ticket, you do your sidewalk and you're right with the world, 
Uh, if two months goes by and it happens again, I'm thinking that really shouldn't be your second offense. That should be your first offense of that snow event, that it would reset by snow event so people wouldn't stay at $250 all the time, um, you know, if they're later than 24 hours. We so that was the logic behind that. We used to have the phenomenon of downtown parking when we had a $5 ticket. Mm -hmm. Someone would park downtown in the morning and say, five bucks to park all day. What's the harm? That's great. That's cheap. I can park all day in an ideal space in front of my place. When we change the law to say that if they continue to, they can be ticketed on every hour, and it will become cumulative. Now, maybe some extenuating circumstances, maybe they parked the car and went to Disneyland. But the fact is, is that, that they would be held accountable for that time. And I think the purpose of this, the intent of this, and I think that the situation you describe opens it up for the opportunity to appeal. Um, I, I would prefer that we actually have the standard that if there is someone who is a scofflaw who says, all right, fine, I got my fine, I'll just wait until the next storm. The next storm doesn't come till, till another month later and their sidewalk is impassable during that whole period. There's no, there's no further incentive beyond the uh, outstanding ticket that they have. They got their one ticket and, they're, and they're, they basically bought their right to ride out to the next storm. So I, 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 it doesn't make sense to me. I think that when we, do, when we build in these escalating fines to the purpose that we did this with um, <laughs> feeding the bears, bring up another, uh, but it, we, the thing was is it, we built in an escalating uh, fine built in to accommodate people who were not, um, whose behavior was not altered by the initial fine. And that with increasing severity, supposedly, you inspire people to be more, com more, more responsive. So if they don't shovel it within 24 hours, you give them a ticket. If 24 hours later they haven't shoveled it, you give them the more expensive ticket. If 24 hours later they haven't shoveled it, you give them another ticket. Uh, but then they shovel it. And two weeks later it snows again. It doesn't start over at 50. It stays at 250 for the rest of the season. It's, well, that's, that's subject to debate. That's I guess the question would be, if you got a ticket, why, would, why wouldn't you address the problem? I mean, why, what, um, I guess. Well, I mean, we're worried about those scoff laws that don't seem to care. Yeah. At $250 a day, they should start caring. Yeah. So would, would a person get a ticket who have shove, shoveled, but they haven't shoveled the full width of the sidewalk, theoretically? That would be a violation. Mm -hmm. that w if they have not shoveled the full width of the sidewalk down to the pavement, According to the standards described, yes, that would be. They would be. Right, but that's not something that's been enforced at all. No, this is part no, of part enforced. of what's inspired. This is the. the are, fact we, are, that are we actually? Much has been enforced. But, it, but my question is, is, is that the intent that we'd actually enforce that? No. The hope is to enforce it and enculturate a sense of, of. So people will people who shovel who routinely shovel their sidewalk, but they don't get rid of that snowbank between mm -hmm. the street and where they've shoveled. They haven't removed that, that snowbank. They're not people, obliged to remove the snowbank. They're obliged to keep the sidewalk clear. Right, but the snowbank is on that is on the sidewalk. Yes, it is. There, uh, uh, virtually everywhere on every street in, in Northampton, every sidewalk has a, a big snowbank in front of the person's house between the street and where they've well, shoveled. As, as we also noted that a lot of the streets actually have those, the grass belt, which actually accommodates. Well, them. yeah, th those, those people so, have those. Ha but the, right. yes, yes, in fact, that is the law now. Right, but it's not enforced. Exactly, we keep going back and forth on the same point. Um, so I'm just, I'm just really shocked if we're actually looking yeah. to enforce that. That's yeah. something, because that's, that's thousands of tickets. Well, the, the. <laughs> it really, it's thousands of, it's probably, if, Two, three thousand yeah, tickets. If so everyone I mean, continues to violate and enforcement is, despite enforcement, then yeah, you're probably right. Okay. Uh, actually, Councillor Labarge. I do know for a fact, Councillor um, Carney, that I do have people on my ward who constantly, okay, when somebody had not done their sidewalk on Ryan Road area specifically, they would go ahead and call the police, and the police will go directly to that person and tell them about the ordinance and to do it full width. Mm -hmm. Now, you're correct, because right now we do have problems, especially on Florence Road, coming down from um, Florence Heights and so forth. Whoever did it, 
and I don't even know whose responsibility it is, if it's Florence Heights or not, but it's not full width. It's tiny. And how people can even walk on it, it's so deplorable. Over by the ice pond, the same thing too. That's a mess over there. So I don't know who's taking care of all these sidewalks. It should be noted that um, usually what the enforcement officers do is pro give a warning first and explain what the law is yeah. and explain what the potential for the violation is. So the op opportunity, the option here is that we do with all these things is not to generate money or to create a crisis, but it's to actually to uh, encourage the behavior that we all, I, I, I haven't heard anyone speak in opposition of trying to pr improve and enhance uh, passage to the sidewalks. It's not to, to go out and generate a new revenue stream by uh, fining every person in the city for not accommodating, but to be more conscientious when they shovel. That they're not just shoveling, you, you see a lot of tenancy shovelers uh, who are shoveling just literally to their car, a, a single width of a shovel, which does nothing for the people who need to pass on the sidewalk. And we have people walking the streets. It is, we are condemning people with disabilities. We are condemning people with strollers to be stuck in their houses and, or to walk on the street in unsafe situations. This is the tool that we have. This is an enhanced tool. This isn't, it's enhanced, it's not, and it makes it easier to actually negotiate with the public and not give them something that's an onerous criminal citation which uh, currently the police are very reluctant to give because, and the cry that we hear frequently is that there's not enough enforcement and that the police are reluctant because who wants to go to court to go talk and debate an issue whereas now you have a line of appeal or, uh, with a discretionary now, officer? We think there'll be less reluctance now, the enforcement. I think there'll be more opportunity for people to become educated and this is, as the mayor says, particularly concerning relative central business district. There are some business owners who aren't necessarily as assiduous as they as we would hope and this is where we have our principal pedestrian traffic and uh, in the past we became accustomed to the bid plowing and clearing those sidewalks and everyone just they woke up one morning every morning and look at the sidewalks are perfect. That's not happening anymore and particularly this winter it became very obvious and we were approached, Councilor Adams, Councilor O'Donnell and myself and the mayor were approached by a number of business owners who were very concerned about this mm -hmm. because and so the intent is not to just suddenly swoop down with a bunch of flying monkeys and punish people for not accommodating the sidewalk thing. I mean the, the, the purpose is to promote mm -hmm. a greater and increased <coughs> awareness of how we, how we meet our obligations of making sure the uh, abutting sidewalks, the curb cuts are clear, the sidewalks are clear. It's why mine, yep. it's why mine's clear is because I was one of the authors of that and I, if I, I didn't want to be that jerk who right. wrote that rule and then didn't meet the conditions of that rule. But it's true, I do lift <coughs> an entire snowbank up over right. into my yard. Right. And that's all, and it, I, I fully support the whole thing, but it is, but I think that people don't understand that piece that the entire width of the sidewalk needs to be clear and the only way to do that is to lift that up and put it into your yard and I and and especially it's it's difficult for people because that's snow that's come off the street so snow that's come on the street is now on their sidewalk and they're supposed to take it and pick it up and put it in their yard and I think people that is the law and I support it but I think most people don't understand that well I think that comes with education and hopefully as as uh, the uh, if this should pass, that the uh, empowered officers will make a point of warning people first yep. and explaining to them what their obligations are. And then after that warning, then, then there are consequences. Okay. Uh, Councillor, Le actually, Councillor Labarge, you spoke last, Councillor Murphy, then Councillor Labarge, then Councillor O'Donnell. What, one of the other things that concerns me about it is that it, it really doesn't cut any accommodation for seniors or people with some disabilities that may not have the capacity to do that. Uh, I mean, I know myself, you know, I, I spend thousands of dollars on snow removal. Now I have a lot of property to do, but it can be really expensive for a senior or somebody on a fixed income that doesn't have the capacity to do it themselves. I mean, I don't feel bad at all for somebody that wants to play video games and not go shovel their sidewalk. 
but you know if, if if you are a single senior living at home and you don't have the physical capacity to do it it can be very expensive to pay someone to do it and, and that isn't really dealt with here anymore. and I know at one point in time um, the senior center actually had volunteers that went out and helped mm -hmm. those people, but I don't know if that's still in place or not. Yes, it is. It is. We had it is. Monday it's night. It is. From it's still Monday in night place. at public safety, we had a police officer that said he felt so bad for a senior that he had to go ticket that he shoveled her sidewalk for, so he didn't have to ticket her. <laughs> I mean, we really have to come up with a mechanism, I think, that works in that case, so that you know these vulnerable citizens, some of whom we want to shovel the sidewalk so they cannot walk in the road. Are going to get in trouble because they physically can't do it and they can't right. afford to do it. Council the barge, Council Specter hasn't spoken on this point yet, and then you'll okay. be next, and then okay. Council O'Donnell. Yeah, I'm not even sure. I, 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 I'm going to just say this, and then maybe if other people pick up on it, I'd offer it as an amendment. <coughs> Is it possible to write in on that table of the of the fines and the offenses? Do we want to say that the first thing would be that by policy we're saying you would get a warning the first time? That's an amendment that you're making them. But yeah, I, well, I kind of want, we'll see if we get a, I get a second on that. So I will throw that in. Then on the, I seconded at least for discussion. At least for, yeah. Okay. So for the purpose yeah, of discussion, we're now speaking to a, a, a counselor, counselor Spector's amendment, which is to provide, uh, to add to the fee schedule. Uh, the okay. first violation would be a warning and Councilor O'Donnell at that point. Yeah, to, to the, um, to the amendment, I mean, I, and, and to the council president's early, earlier point about changing the culture, I mean, it's less important to have a draconian fine than it is to get people used to the fact that you ought, ought to do this. So I don't necessarily feel the first violation does have to be $50. It could be a warning. It could be $5. Um, and I, I might suggest we also consider, I don't want to make it too complicated, but do we have to go to 250 We could have four levels increasing fifty dollars each time and end up at at two hundred um, but um, you know I, I I think there's always a discretionary option for a warning um, but I could see the the value of having a, at least a very low fine the first time Councilor Carney to uh, the amendment yeah, I, I, just as the councillor said there's a discretionary uh, factor to this and obviously because the discretion has been um, really more of the practice of not giving any fine. I, I think it's very, very, very rare that fines are given for this. So I, I don't know that it's necessary to actually write in that the first violation should be a warning. I mean, I think it's understood that if anything, the, the, the present, current practice is warning. I, 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 th I, don't, I, don't, yeah. I can't imagine that anybody has been given a fine without first been given a warning. And so I think police actually have a they they make they've made up a card form. that actually right. has the ordinance printed on it. It's like so a rather than red but <coughs> my point is rather than writing in, I, I, would, I would I don't think we need this right. amendment. I don't think that we need to actually state that a warning should be the first action. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's I understood agree. in the same way that the the whole thing is discretionary on everybody's part. So I I, I would say that. Rather than mandating that there be a warning given first, I think it's just understood. Councilor Klein to the amendment. It's not to the amendment. Okay. Uh, Councilor Specter, was it to the amendment? I guess, yeah, and, and I would even withdraw the amendment in a moment. I won't quite yet. But someone might buy this argument. Just to hold the floor? <laughs> yeah, just okay. hold the floor. Hold the I think floor. that when you start adding um, some of our most conscientious folks who, who would be also giving tickets on this, who are folks. Um, who give parking tickets. I'm just also thinking about the public when they read this, that it's like, oh my goodness, now we've got these great parking people who do a fantastic job. And just the other day, I was parked for like three minutes and came out and they did their job. I had a meter ran out and I got a ticket. I'm just thinking, you know, it just in terms of the, what you were saying earlier, of people reading this and seeing it, and going, oh my God, now I'm gonna get ticketed. I was just saying it to kind of soften it that, okay, the first time you get a, a warning. And now I will withdraw my, Amendment. All right, so we're not discussing the amendment anymore because it's been withdrawn. So we're back to the regular order, which put Council LaBarge up next for it. Um, I have concerns too about the elderly and the difficulties that they do have because of their disabilities also. I do know for a fact that the um, senior center does have and still has the communication that, and it's even on the radio for the city, 
that we can call the senior center for people with disabilities or a senior. I also think we could also communicate whatever the changes are going to be on this new ordinance by placing something in the census. That would get out to everybody on the language and any changes. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell? Was uh, Councilor Klein? Councilor, oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Klein. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. Um, so I have a question and a suggestion. Uh, my question is, have we looked at how other cities have done this? Is this based on other yes. models? Well, we looked at the ordinance. We, uh, when we wanted to update the ordinance, we looked at a number of different um, cities uh, of similar size and sort of modeled our language after that. And did, did you also have any kind of evidence of how it's worked for the particular city that you used the model of? Not really. I mean, I think this is just a, I mean, this is a perennial issue. I mean, you talk about, you know, for every senior who can't shovel their sidewalk, we get a call from a senior who said, I can't walk to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, you know, and, um, or my walker can't go down the sidewalk. So, I mean, it's just, it's the, you know, it's, this is a perennial seasonal issue. And, um, and a lot of this, and if we didn't, and it's not like we just said, oh, let's think of a new way to find people. I mean, this is in response to people who call and say, you know, I walked down Bridge Road and suddenly the sidewalk that we built for the kids to get to school hasn't been shoveled by the owner of that property. And so now kids can't get to school. And so then we're trying to figure out who the owner is and track them down and find them and, you know, do all that kind of stuff. So, that, I mean, I'm just saying that, that we're not... This isn't happening just because we're doing it to come up with creative ways to create, you know, fines. It's, it really is trying to respond to a public. Just demand. to clarify, I yeah. wasn't critiquing yeah, no, no, no. at all. I no, was I get really that. just asking so, a question about yeah. whether or not there are models out there and whether. We yeah, I think I think what I what we found is we've tried the, um, you know, I think the police have generally given warnings and and mostly informational. Like here's a they they printed up little, uh, bright yellow or or red flyers that have the sidewalk ordinance and they've gone to people who haven't shoveled and given them this warning and said, you know, we can cite you and, and uh, f this $50 um, to try to get them to shovel. And I think um, what we've heard is that there are some habitual folks who just, you know, especially, especially I think the um, non owner occupied property owners in particular um, who, you know, uh, I don't know if it's built into the lease, but they just they tend to just not do. They're the same people who don't trim their hedges, and they tend to be, um, you know, again the same that aren't attentive to their property. So, um, so I think the idea was in looking at other communities, they had kind of a progressive fine system to try to create more. Because you know, if somebody you know gets gets mailed <laughs> these fifty dollar summonses basically, um, and can pretty much I guess. Norm and and uh, you know and so but if they start to ratchet up and they start to get more and more expensive <coughs> then it might be an incentive for them to come into compliance so so my my comment is that I just think that this potentially could be a, a fraught system I think Councillor Carney brought up some valid concerns I think I mean they're just um, innumerable issues that could arise but I also feel like I don't suggest that we legislate like this all the time but I feel like we should call the question move forward and see how it works for a season and we may have to revisit this issue but I think that we can just go around and around here with you know the potential ways in which this is fraught and going to be fraught but we we have to just move forward with it so i i really would suggest that are, we call are the you question. calling the question and, and yes, I, well i i feel bad because i know that councillor o'donnell's been waiting but i i just hope that we can move in that direction quickly mm -hmm. yeah i mean so, so you're not calling the i'm not calling the question i'm suggesting that maybe after councillor o'donnell we call the question if i can do that well i I'm, I have a suggestion as well, and, and it's a very humble suggestion. Is I, I also agree we should try and move forward. I think we should debate amendments on this, specific amendments, and then vote on it. I don't want to cut off debate on it, but I, I do think we should right. change. You know, let's 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 fix the words <laughs> that make up the ordinance. And so I would like to propose an amendment, um, and that is to on um, in section 40-5 <clears throat> change the word same event. To, um, to season beginning October 1st because I don't think it should be per event. I think it should be per season 
that's my first shot at defining what a season is. And I would accept modifications to that. But I accept a friendly amendment? That, yeah, that's, I mean, absolutely. I guess if you were, I mean, this is going to look weird to the public, but if you were to say fiscal year, um, right. that would be at least that would encompass a full winter, and that's at least fine. it would fit within our computer systems somehow. Yeah, um, I, I, that is fine. I accept that as a friendly amendment. Yeah, the purpose being the fine should reset only after a year <coughs> per snowstorm. That's my Fiscal motion. year. Is, yeah. is there a second time? Because a year could span two winters. So okay. that's uh, why, the same that's winter. Clear. I understand. The same winter. So that's yep. why fiscal year would be July 1st to June 30th. Should I restate one winter. My, one winter. motion? Or? Yeah. Would, my, would. my motion is to, to um, strike out same event in both instances and change it to fiscal year. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. Is there a second to that? Discussion on the amendment. Council Murphy. I think it's consistent with what we've been doing tonight because shoveling your sidewalk is damn good aerobic exercise. <laughs> so you could draw like an analogy to riding your bike. We're willing to say it's a good idea to ride your bike. It's an equally good <laughs> idea to shovel your sidewalk. <laughs> People are riding. So I'm all for so it. We wouldn't have the winters that we Sock it to them. <laughs> exactly. Because yeah, you can't ride your bike in the winter, right? So you can shove your sidewalk. Council Adams. I have an amendment to change it. Well, we're still on this amendment. So, 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 <laughs> did you want to speak to this amendment? No, I don't. Uh, any discussion on the, any further discussion on the amendment? Second. All those in favor of the amendment, as stated, is the um, two. I for, just have a, a before, okay. <laughs> so that means that if someone has been warned first about the about the snow that's on their sidewalk, and then the and then. Okay, so they only get one shot before it, before it then moves up, and that's over the winter. So that example then that Councillor Murphy gave, that someone is gone for a week. I mean, and again, we're thinking all, all of this is discretionary, so I guess we would hope that there'd be some consideration given for the person who, whose person who was supposed to come and shovel their, their walk while they were gone to Florida. Um, and, and you know, it fell off the radar and they didn't do it. Something like the, you know, Senator Kerry, you know. I mean, he did get the fine, he did pay the fine, but I, I do get concerned that it would mount up in, in the course of a week. I do too. I, I just, I'm just saying, well, I would just hope that, I, I, but again, it's all, understanding that this whole thing is discretionary. Mm -hmm. and it's also subject the to past appeal. Practice, and the past practice has been no fines. I mean, I, I think it's very rare that even a $50 uh, ticket has been written for anyone. I might be wrong. I, I, am I wrong? There are, there are very, very rare and few cases. Case that we've had to actually, maybe a handful. Had, in a few cases, we've actually had to plow and send them. A, we have had to exercise. You'll note that's okay. the last, okay. yeah, that's actually the, the last way. item that. And there's probably no more than a, a company being able to count on two hands when in fact there are thousands and thousands of violations, so. Mm -hmm. the, the, remember, it's also subject to a, <coughs> yep. an appeal, and at least we're, one of the things that's built in this is not a criminal citation, so they don't have to go to court. They can go and appeal yep. to, to. Right. To, these, are, so. these are things that, these are fines that we're, I, I'll go ahead and, and support the stiffening. The more we stiffen the fine, it's just about the, it's really all about the enforcement. It's, it's about whether or not we enforce that's going to mm -hmm. make a difference. We can step in the pond as much as we can. I know. Well, so to, to, we're actually uh, still talking about the amendment? Yeah, I'll so, go ahead. Yeah, I think so, you were about to call, you were calling it and I interrupted. That's you correct. You were about to call the roll call. Council Murphy to the amendment. To the amendment. I mean, if they're reluctant to write $50 tickets, how reluctant are they going to be to write $250 tickets? Because right. from three on, they're all $250 tickets. Right. You know, are they just going to go, you know, in a week's time, I'm going to hammer you that much money? Well, are they going to do it? I, I, I think we can debate this to the point of ludicrousness. We can, we can actually escalate it to ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is it's, I think compliance, <clears throat> the issue is to promote compliance. And whatever we need to improve what we have now. This, by my reckoning, improves it substantially, and including the amendment. Um, and I think it in, improves, enhances enforcement and in compliance, more importantly. And if, and they're subject to review. If there are people, 
And it's not going to be many. If there are people who just say, I don't care, $250, I don't care. If they continue to violate, then we address that on a different level, And I think, at some point. there. And the other thing is, I should mention item C on this ordinance, is upon neglect or violation of the duties imposed by the provisions of the subsections, essentially the city can go and plow it and charge them for that. Right. And if I, if I may, it sounds as though the whole reason that we're having this, the whole reason that this came before us is there were some violators in the downtown area, and in order to be able to deal with those, we needed to be able to broaden the enforcing authorities. It has nothing to do, really, with the thousands of violations that there are across the city in the residential areas. I would imagine, I mean, that's not the impetus, because that law was already on the book. That law was already there. We already had the ability to go and find. The frustration anyone. has been expressed. It's not just exclusive to downtown. There's been frustration expressed throughout the neighborhoods. Okay. Some of the reasons. So, Councilor Adams. Liability will be another incentive too. Yes. Oh, there's another good point. Okay. That's not so I, I didn't mean to. I mean, <laughs> I know you were in the middle of calling the 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 role on the amendment, and I'll support it. But again, the point I'm making is, it's not about how much we. It's it's all about the enforcement. Yes. It's, not about, it's all about the enforcement and, and whether or not we even get that first $50 ticket. It doesn't matter whether it's the first, second, third, or fourth. It's whether the first one's ever left. To the amendment, any other comments? All those in favor of the amendment, uh, the amendment reads now that uh, the fiscal year is instead, it deletes the language per event for citation and now says within a fiscal year, within the same fiscal year, right? Correct. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes, I'm opposed. One. Any abstentions? Okay, so one no. And Councilor Adams has an amendment. My amendment would be to change it to 930. Um, I, on February 19th, I was at the Downtown Business Community uh, Committee, excuse me, uh, meeting, and there were many people from the business community a significant amount of them uh, who felt that 930 would be a more fair time certainly not that's not you know that's that's not the entire business community as we heard from what miss uh, Perone had to say about it but um, um, that that's my amendment so second to the amendment for purposes of discussion I'll second okay All right. uh, to the amendment Councilor Shara um, I I support it as written um, I actually think it's a safety issue there are plenty of people that need to be downtown and walk uh, before 9.30, there are employees that have to get the businesses that need to open. The cot shelter um, at um, 7 a.m. is when people need to leave the cot shelter in the morning. Um, there are a lot of people that need to get to the bus stops. Um, I actually think it's it's good for the businesses to have it everything cleared before things open up um, for themselves, <laughs> their employees, and also for everyone who has to get places. Now this supersedes that it's still snowing you know everything else is 24 hours after it stops snowing if it's snowing like crazy right. at that time do we expect these people to be out there clearing their sidewalks if it's still snowing because that's the way it's written uh, uh, Councilor Klein I think there are two good points on the floor here I think that expecting a business owner to pay an employee to come in an hour and a half early to start shoveling is a lot to expect of a business owner. However, I do agree. I think there's a real safety issue here. Um, I'm wondering if we can maybe somehow meet halfway or make it 8 o'clock instead of uh, 8.30 or something. I'm just I'm trying to figure this one out because I do think that it's a lot to ask business owners to bring in their employees early to do the snow clearing. Um, it should be noted that one of the requests was our, to modify it to 10 o'clock because that's when mo many businesses open. So that was one of the requests, and I think Councilor Adams was trying to split the difference with this amendment. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, uh, uh, Councilor LaBarge, you had your hand up. Do you still, you yes. still in yes. to the amendment? To the amendment. To the amendment. So the amendment yeah. is, is um, <laughs> I'm sorry. To 9 sorry, I blanked out. Yes, it's uh, the, the time, the deadline time for central business principally. Right, my question is the mayor, have you been hearing from the business people also on a later time? This actually was an uh, amendment that was a modification that was done by the ordinance committee. This wasn't part of my original ordinance. I, I actually support it. I think it makes sense. 
um, but I but this wasn't part of my original ordinance. So I have not. I've heard. I have heard the issue like that that Bud Stockwell mentioned um, about you know eight being too early. On the other hand, um, there are a number of businesses that open yeah. that don't open at ten. I mean, there's a lot of service businesses like the dry cleaners and the coffee shops and bagel City shops Hall. and. Yeah. Even City Hall opens before ten, uh, but we shovel our own sidewalks. Um, but um, but so that there is yeah so that it it's a balancing act, and then there's there's workers who have to get to those establishments. So I, I haven't but I haven't heard a whole lot about it. I just think that um, the eight o'clock I, I think it struck some people as too early, but it's probably the people that are used to open their doors at ten, not the ones that are opening their doors at six or you know, so. Uh, Councilor Carney, then Councilor O'Donnell. Okay, yes, I do agree with Councilor Shara that um, the 8 a.m. is more reasonable given the level of business that people are people are moving around by eight and, and need to have clear sidewalks. To answer uh, Councilor Murphy's question about whether, while it's still snowing, it clearly says in the ordinance that after snow has ceased to fall, thereupon or whenever snow shall have collected. So I think it assumes that the snow shall have fallen and stopped. And it's actually, you have within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So according to this, you have within 24 hours the next 8 a.m. that happens to occur. No, no, no. no, no. no. The, the, with, there are actually just... Within 24 hours or by 8 a.m. on the next business, business day, day, whichever is sooner. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, so that's 8 a.m. Oh, whichever is sooner. Right. Yes. Okay. So if it, if the snow stopped at at uh, ten at night the night before, eight in the morning the you need morning. to. But if the yeah. snow stopped at nine a.m., you have until the following. The fall. You have twenty-four hours the right. following. Okay. And again, this is not. I mean, most businesses are out shoveling their walk. Yeah. Yeah. The start I mean, of I, I, I don't think I mean, that eight a.m. is isn't like something that's being onerously put on them. They 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 want you know they want customers and commerce. They want uh -huh. to do that. So. Right. Um, I think I sent Councillor Adams a picture the other morning. Of, at 9.30, it was sort of a patchwork, and there were people out there shoveling and, and getting the sidewalk cleared after that last little slush storm we had. Councillor Donald, to, to the um, amendment. No, Councillor Carney explained what I wanted to explain. Okay. Anything else relative to this amendment, to the, uh, the 9.30 time? I mean, I, I would say that, um, to Councillor Murphy's point, or, or actually, Councilor Klein's point, if we're about hiring somebody to come in early to do it, as Councilor Murphy actually said, there's a cost associated with this. Right. Always. There's a cost uh, associated, as Councilor Adams pointed out, with the liability. If you, you know, we have a number of downtown businesses who are concerned about people who present as impediments to their businesses. The snow is an even greater impediment uh, for potential customers. Now, since <coughs> The one thing that distinguishes central business is it's actually a system, less so than, than the neighborhoods. This is a system at which point um, that functions on access, that needs the access. So again, this is, you know, we're, we're, try, we're struggling to deal with the phenomenon that occurs throughout the Northeast and other places that snow. We all have those, and every community has these same regulations and the same frustrations, and you hear people annually complain about the snow and the winter and the shoveling and all that stuff that goes with it as if it never happened the previous year before. The fact is is that we are struggling with the best way that we can accommodate it and encourage and educate people that uh, how much emphasis and this is the same thing as promoting bicycles as Council Murphy said it's what we're aspiring to. It's and so with that we're creating a definitive structure the bid, when the, it functioned, even though it it never existed, it turns out, but it magically made the snow go away every morning before business for most businesses downtown. That's no longer the case. And as a result, we had a number of businesses request um, a better way to deal with, with snow issues. Um, so, and that's what this is. I think actually 930, I think is fine. I think it's reasonable. I think even though, the fact that there are people will be struggling. The one thing that you also recognize when you step out in the snow that there is going to—it's not going to be perfect every time, everywhere you go, at, at every moment. We're trying to just make the best situation possible that accommodates all the all the stresses and pressures that go with it. I, I believe me, I'm sympathetic. I dread every snowfall where I do have to lift my entire snowbank up into my yard. <clears throat> and although it does save me money, Jim. 
So, uh, to the amendment. Just a quick question on the amendment. Why 9.30 instead of 9? Seems like a nice simple time. Um, well, I mean, they, the reasons they stated were, were fairness. And, and, I, and I, I, I do think, and I, and I pointed this out at the meeting, mm -hmm. was that they're thinking from a retail perspective. And I did point out the point that was raised here that, you know, um, cafes and other, you know, the other, other named businesses are are open well before then. Mm -hmm. But their points were that, you know, if, if, if ticketing started at 930, yeah. all those other businesses are welcome to start shoveling whenever they want. But they wanted till 930 for those other types of businesses that do open a little bit later to have that time before they could get ticketed. And the others are welcome to do it earlier if they want. That was, that was, I think that was their thinking. Right, the, the ordinance is sort of for businesses that wouldn't normally do it, would have no incentive to do it. If you open at 8 o'clock, you kind of have an incentive, I suppose, mm -hmm. to your point, perhaps. Yes, I mean, even on Main Street, you have an eye doctor on Main Street. People go in, you, you can have an appointment for 8 o'clock in the morning. So I have concerns about that time, 9.30 especially people with disabilities what do we do here well we we vote on the amendments what we do and uh, <laughs> it can be if, revisited. what's that it can be revisited and, and it can be revisited week. this 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 as as problems present themselves and they will we can make adjustments to accommodate those problems but we have to start somewhere so I will start by asking all those in favor for the amendment the amendment is to change the time for central business from 8 to 9 30. yes right correct all the, you say all those in favor yeah no i, I was just saying I, first of all I was, that was defining the the amendment which okay. apparently is right <laughs> so all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. Yes. aye. any opposed no opposed. Roll call on that. you want to do a roll call on um, yeah i think so okay roll call please <clears throat> Councilor O'Donnell? No. Councilor Scherer? No. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? No. Councilor Gordon? Yes. Councilor Klein? No. Councilor Labarge? No. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Uh, I believe the amendment failed. Okay, so we're back to the original question. Uh, are there any other amendments? Okay, Councilor O'Donnell. <laughs> um, we might consider having the greatest uh, fine amount be hundred dollars, not two fifty. So I, I propose we um, we st we um, strike the second violation line and make the subsequent violation to be hundred dollars. The point is not large fines. The point is to get people in the habit of. Things. So my final idea. The, the amendment is to strike the 250 uh, line for the uh, fee schedule and just leave it at $50 to $100. Is there a second on the amendment? And to clarify, it would, second violation would become subsequent violation. Subsequent violation, thank you. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. I don't second. Oh, there's a second. There's a second. So, uh, discussing the amendment. Uh, Councilor Klein. Clarification. So it would be a $50 fine the first time, $100 the second time, and for, that would be it. For all subsequent, yep. For all subsequent, okay. And to clarify, so that by subsequent, that means every 24 hours you could be fined $100 again. Right. As long as you have not shoveled. Again, uh, um, I don't. It's all about the enforcement. It's all about whether even the first fine is ever given. But I do think that the, the way that it's written, with a maximum fine of two hundred and fifty dollars, does give us the opportunity to fine two hundred and fifty. Uh, the the discretion is always there. So even after the first hundred, even after the fifty, and then the hundred, if if um, if we're looking for discretion and we don't want to give out 250 we just don't which is what the pra present practice is right now is we just don't but I think having the $250 there <coughs> just allows for those really egregious violators to find them for $250 if we want 
So I, I would leave it as is with the 250 is my, is the option there for, for that to be able to be given. Any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, you want to do a roll call on this? Roll call? No, we're doing it. Um, Councilor Chair. Uh, the, the amendment is to change the fine schedule. Okay. So, and to just be 50 and $100. Thank you. No. Fiscal year. Fiscal year. So we're doing the roll call. And Councilor Sherrod has already voted no. Councilor Spector. No. Councilor Adams. No. Councilor Carney. No. Yes. Okay. So that amendment fails. Any other ones? <coughs> I'd like to split the difference on this this question of the businesses um, needing to shovel by 8 a.m. is really bothering me, and I'm really trying to create some split of difference here in the timing because if you as a business are expected to have someone there at 7:30 to shovel by 8. Um, I think that there's a big difference between getting an employee there um, two and a half hours before business opens or something like an hour and a half before business opens to shovel. So I would like to make an amendment that we're talking that we have it by 9 a.m. as opposed to 9.30 or 8. Is there a second to the proposed amendment to change the time? Second. second. There is a second. Okay. Uh, any debate on that? I just the original reason was for the safety of people who are downtown and in the same way that it, it's a it is it's a burden on everyone to clear the snow from their sidewalk whether it's in front of their residence or in front of their store mm -hmm. um, it's a burden that we all carry and, it, it, and whether you go down there yourself and shovel or you know, do what many people do, which is hire someone to come and, and shovel everybody. De uh, many people do that for their own, those who can't shovel or can't plow their, their driveway, hire someone to come. And it's just one of those costs of, of living in the winter. Um, I, I agree with the original reasoning that 8 a.m. is a reasonable time because it's such a busy area downtown, even at 8 a.m., people coming out of the, the cot shelter, especially is packed this time of year, and people who are otherwise walking to work, to cafes, to restaurants, to all those other appointments and businesses and city hall or places that are open already at 8.30. So um, I, again, I, I just think that 8 is a reasonable time. Um, I'd like to note that we're coming up to the witching hour for when we can no longer deliberate. Suspend, so Suspend 27. Right, suspend the rule. You you want to there's a motion to suspend rule 27, which requires us to uh, adjourn at 11. And there's a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Bet there's a no. Is aye. <laughs> and there's one day. Okay. Um, the uh, now we're to the we're back to the amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, uh, roll call again on this one, please. This is to change the time to 9 o'clock again, yes. But this is instead of 9.30, it's, not, it's 9 o'clock. To change it to 9 o'clock. 9.31 was defeated. This is the not, to uh, mod, uh, an amendment to change it to 9 o'clock. Take it away. Councilor <laughs> Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. No. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. No. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. No. Councilor Sherrod. No. Uh, oh. Five yes. Five yes. That amendment passes. Uh, so the half hour. Does anyone want to talk about school start at this point? Go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> um, all right, now we're back to the original question. Any other discussion on the original question? As amended. Roll call, please. Okay, I just wanted to come down with voting on the 
We're voting on both, yes. Both both the uh, fee schedule and enforcement and also the dictate of the rule yeah. uh, so uh, eliminating criminal <coughs> citation and defining the terms for the central business district and the city of, and, and general business in Florence and the city at large. Okay. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Uh, yes. Councilor Gordon. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Lavar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Chair. Yes. Councilor Speck. Yes. That passes in first reading. It, it will come up subject to uh, another discussion at <coughs> our next meeting, and perhaps we'll hear from the public in the interim. Um, and hopefully there'll be no snowstorms in between then and next time. So. Next up is a first reading for an ordinance regarding stormwater flood control utility fee. This comes with a positive recommendation from the board of, uh, from the public. Mr. President, could I suggest we take um, the one that uh, Ms. Mish may talk about out of order and move that up? Sure, you want, uh, that's G, is that what you're uh, talking about? Correct, yeah. Yeah, 14.331. 14331 Item G, which is the ordinance pertaining to stormwater management as part of the site plan review, coming with a positive recommendation from the planning on uh, January 8, 2015. No recommendation from the Public Works Committee or of the City Council on uh, January 5th of 2015, and no recommendation <coughs> from the Committee on Rules, Ordinances, Orders, I mean, Rules, Orders, Appointments. Uh, Carolyn Mish remains recognize so Carolyn if you want to come and speak to that this ordinance is um, again sort of one of those ordinances to clarify what the planning board and offices of Planning and Sustainability and Department of Public Works have already been asking of applicants when they come forward for site plan approval, and that is um, for site plan applications. This is two sections. One is the procedures for submission, what you have to show um, in your application, and the second one is what the approval criteria is for the planning board. Um, so this first section, 11.5, um, clarifies uh, or spells out that um, applicants, as it relates to stormwater, need to show what the water quality impacts would be, what their planned um, uh, best management practices would be during the construction phase um, to manage runoff that might be coming off the site during construction and potentially after construction if they're a big enough project to trigger a full stormwater analysis. Um, and the next section talks about major projects, which is anything that's over 5,000 square feet of new construction or which by zoning automatically is deemed to be um, a major project. So um, there's a, and this is to address um, uh, requirements that we now encourage applicants to show how they're going to manage stormwater in a way that's not a piped mechanical system. Um, but first look at what we call green infrastructure, which could be the use of rain gardens or swales or um, previous pavement. So um, <coughs> the, the idea is to get it down in text to say this is what we expect you to look at first instead of the default or what has been the default up until this point, which is um, many times detention basins and catch basins and, and pipes that take the water away from the site. Um, and then in the, um, um, there are also a subset of projects that are bigger than, that are 5,000 square feet that would be triggered um, and would have to look at these, um, um, these types of systems that don't already trigger a separate Department of Public Works uh, stormwater permit. So those um, public works um, jurisdictional permits are for disturbance of an acre or more of a site. So there are some projects that sort of fall in between that are only planning board review, but we still require them to deal with their stormwater on site. It's just not a separate permit from DPW. Um, 
And so then the approval um, process would be that, um, um, that which we already require is um, to um, make sure that the maintenance of these systems, um, there's, a, there's a set of procedures for maintenance and it's spelled out and recorded prior to construction. So, and then there's some minor tweaks to um, the, the type of um, design storm that we want applicants to, um, to um, design around. Councilor Bart. When I went over this, I kind of like compared the bicycle one and pedestrian with this. Looking at it is an example of it. This is why I'm looking at it, making it clearer. Yes. Is that right. what this is all about? Right. And also, I think putting the standard standards in place, mm -hmm. especially like with EPA and so forth, I right. think is very detrimental for this. So the one, I, I want to go back to, the, there wasn't a recommendation coming out of um, Public Works. I think there was a little bit of confusion at, at the, the, they were the first ones to review it. Um, Doug McDonald from DPW wasn't able to be at that meeting, so I think there was a little bit of confusion about a concern that the EPA standards hadn't quite been written yet. We know we're expecting these new standards from EPA to come down, um, that will come down to, um, indicate what Northampton will be required to um, address in terms of stormwater. And so I think Public Works got a little confused that this might be putting the cart before the horse, whereas this is really just general language saying, here's what, we, here's what we've, all, we've been expecting already, and um, we want you to design for these um, alternative systems or what are becoming more standard systems, actually, in terms of green infrastructure. So um, I don't think that uh, it's my understanding that the reason that there was no recommendation wasn't because they didn't think that it was a valid ordinance, but that they felt that perhaps um, we should wait until EPA comes down with their final um, standards, which we don't know when will happen. I guess fair assessment. I think that's a fair <coughs> assessment. I, I won't necessarily speak to but I think I, I support this amendment because I think it's not just what the EPA is saying. The EPA is saying they hopefully because they make sense and help their standards make sense. So if we put standards in place, I think these are sensible standards, mm -hmm. sensible things to ask. And hopefully the EPA will be equally as sensible. If anything, they'll be more specific <coughs> and maybe more yeah. um, have more implications than what this states. And uh, uh, Pam pointed out to me, which I appreciate. Um, the Public Works Committee, back in January 5th, um, pertaining to this, stated that, uh, well, the position was that the EPA may mandate other changes to the ordinance. So the ordinance was sent forward with a no recommendation, three nothing, with no with with, with no recommendation, but with a suggestion that the council vote to table it until the EPA makes further recommenda recommended changes to the ordinance. Thank you. And so your clarification is that this is an anticipation of rules that you expect are coming anyway and that it just clears up what? This is what we already require now. Require. And the stormwater ordinance says that we encourage, uh, so the separate DPW jurisdictional stormwater ordinance already says all of the stuff it requires recording of um, stormwater management plan. So there's there's nothing really here that's different than what we already require. It's just not written down in the zoning. And is what? it possible with further EPA mandates that we might be amending this or changing or modifying this in the future, depending on their ruling? Um, it's possible that we would be adding more specificity. I don't think we'd be um, <coughs> subtracting anything out of this. So one of the things, <clears throat> having been with this for a number of years, it keeps seem, seeming like what I heard from the DPW, because I think I asked the question in the meeting of how soon, kept seeming like the EPA was going to almost immediately come forward. You'll notice that in the, um, the beacon, there's an article about how the EPA once again extended the discussion. So it's been going on. I think we first heard about this in the 
when we had the joint committee three or four years ago, and it kept seeming like it would be six months. So I think it's finally time for us to act. It could be another three years before the EPA comes out. So that's, that's the change I have felt even in the last two months, that it just seems like the EPA just keeps extending the deadline. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Rivera. Yes. Councillor Sarah. Yes. Councillor Sexton. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Yes. And we don't anticipate there's uh, that passes. I'm sorry, in first reading, and we don't anticipate <coughs> that we do. We anticipate that we need Carolyn to stick around. To, no. Do you want to be liberated? <laughs> She's got her thumb drive. She's ready to go home. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Carolyn. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So we're back up to, uh, you know, it may look optimistic that we're at G, but point of fact, we're at F. <clears throat> we're at F. This is the ordinance regarding stormwater flood control utility fee. Uh, this also comes with a positive recommendation from the Public Works Committee of the City Council on uh, uh, January 5th. 2015 and the, with a recommendation to amend recommendations <laughs> proposed by Public Works. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Which number letter are we at? I F. Thank you. This is 143333. Oh, yes. okay. uh, this comes with a recommendation to amend recommendation proposed by Public Works Committee from the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances on February 18th, 2015. This is the first reading. I'll accept the motion. Put it on the floor. Move approval. Okay, motion's made and seconded, and let me scroll to it here. Um, <clears throat> oh, 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 whoa, I was back on snow removal. All right, I'm sorry. Um, uh, would you like me to read it, or would you prefer a description from the sponsor? Is that okay? Is everyone all right with that? All right. Um, thank you, and just to start out with, I'd like to be clear, since there's two documents in here, which one we're going off of? I'm going to be going off of the one that came from the ordinance committee, which is you might have said that. But I just to be well, that, that's with the yeah with <coughs> it's the assume that's what's on the floor. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, and I also like that to, to thank Councilor Specter for uh, starting the ball, ball rolling on this with me as a sponsor and bring it to the uh, committee on on public works. The point of this is to address uh, an issue that I've heard quite a bit since we enacted the stormwater ordinance um, and created the utility and began to send out bills. And that was from condo association owners. The practice that the Department of Public Works had adopted was simply to take the bill for an entire building or property and divide it up equally based on the number of condo owners or association owners within the building. Um, however, that's not always how condo associations divide up their shared costs. Um, they do it by a percentage of, of common ownership. This ordinance creates um, a new um, tool, I guess, for condo associations to send in to the Department of Public Works that instrument that records the percentage of common ownership um, on file at the Hampshire Registry of Deeds or Hampshire Land Court. And after they do that, the, the DPW will cause them to be billed according to that percentage. In other words, it's just more fair. Um, the whole problem with the stormwater ordinance that we wrestled with was how to make it as equitable as possible. My opinion is it still contains some, um, some inequities uh, that we may want to address in the future, but this is not a major inequity. This is um, one that I think we can address with this ordinance it would just provide for more fair billing of condo associations. Does the chair of ordinance want to speak to the recommendation? Oh, sir, I mean, certainly. Um, this is, in fact, more equitable. If the condo association chooses to get more accurate with the distribution, they have the option of providing the information to do that to the Department of Public Works. And, and you know, in some condominium complex, units are smaller, units are bigger. Uh, some units have more amenities, and they tend to have a larger portion uh, percentage of common ownership. Um, they split the rest of their fees that way, 
that would allow them to split the stormwater fee that way. So if you had a four bedroom unit and somebody else had a one bedroom unit, the bigger unit would probably have a more, uh, a larger share of common ownership. Uh, they would get a bigger bill. I mean, it's just more equitable, but it leaves the burden on the association to say we want to do that and therefore we submit our documents. Councilor Grundy. Uh, just to say, I, I actually had similar conversations with condo associations and we actually had a meeting with the Public Works Department and even though we had a great help from Jim Laurel and Doug McDonald, something like this was exactly what, what we needed to be able to have them feel more comfortable um, in, in order to have an equitable um, mechanism for the residents at Laurel Park. Public Works Committee want to speak to this? I, I have a friendly amendment. Um, after the work, under, under the property association's definition, in the first line, after the word ownership, I have an amendment to clarify it slightly. Um, the amendment would be after ownership, com comma, whether residential, commercial, or multiple use, comma. And that also encompasses, in a different way, the amendment that the Public Works Committee made. Got it. And I, I, I do consider that to be clarifying and friendly. Okay. Thank you. So it's accepted as a friendly amendment. Um, any discussion on the amendment? Those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, did you get it? Okay. If you if you could just send sure. him the amended absolutely. Uh, further discussion on the on the order. No. Boy. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Yes. 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 That passes from first reading. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We've done uh, G. We've done. Now we're up to H. This is the uh, the ordinance amending section 312-1032. No parking on Middle Street in Florence. Does that sound familiar? Is it's being deja vu all over again? This comes with a negative recommendation from the Committee on Rules, Orders, and Appointments and Ordinances on February 18, 2015. Uh, note this ordinance was replaced by another ordinance that was already approved by the City Council. To remove this item from the active list, it will require a City Council vote. I'll accept a motion put on the floor first. I move we vote wait, against I need, this. I need a second. <laughs> second. Okay. And Councilor Murphy, you... you so the little, the little street that wouldn't die here. It, it appears that we, we dealt with Middle Street a couple of meetings ago. It would, just, would appear that this other ordinance is still in the system, and the best way to get rid of it is just to vote it down. And I'd encourage two readings tonight so Middle Street doesn't reappear anytime soon. <laughs> so just to further clarify, if you don't vote against it, I'll have to carry it over to the next session. Yeah. <laughs> so please yeah. vote against it voting, uh, voting in two no. readings, and we'll get rid of it. This is the... This is the old version that we're not doing, so we just got to get we're, it off the books. Okay. We're removing the tail, as it were. So, um, uh, any further discussion on this point? Is everyone fairly clear what we're doing here? You need a roll call? We're eliminating oh, you the do We'll need a roll take call. a roll call on this, so. Go ahead. Councilor Klein. Yes. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good that we have a divided vote. Sorry. We should have a divided vote. I think it'd be good. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I was agreeing oh, no. with you. <laughs> let, let, let me clarify the vote. If you vote yes, this remains on the books if it passes. Thank you. If you vote no, it disappears <laughs> and it's no longer <laughs> redundant. Thank you. So, I vote I'm not encouraging vote. anyone to vote anyway, but I'm just saying that voting no is in a sense voting yes. So, so if your inclination is to vote yes because you like to get rid of this, don't say yes. Say no. Say no. It's for the remedial no. counselors. Councilor Murphy. No. Councilor No. No. Councilor 
Nope. No. Carney? No. No. This is defeated. <laughs> I think, uh, suspend, suspend rule 14. Oh. Second. If it loses, you don't have to do it twice. So. Yeah, you don't have to vote twice on a law. Don't, oh, that's right. right. You don't have to vote twice. It's, it's done. It's dead the first time. Unless somebody wants to do a minority reconsideration, <laughs> there is no minority. <laughs> There's no mon there was a minority that changed, but there is no minority. You could do a majority reconsideration. But it's a little late to go through the entire yeah. charter to figure out what the hell we would do to ourselves. The equivalent of a Scrivener's error. <laughs> right. That's what that was. All right. Whew. So that's it. No, that's not it. Well, that's that's done for that. That's what I mean. I move right. to move to send all, all the referrals as a group. The two referrals that are pending that Councilor Adams refers to are the ordinance pertaining to campaign spending limits. There's two. Right. We remove so the tree the 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 tree definitions and and, and uh, has been withdrawn pending an appointment of a tree committee so that it can be referred to them so that they can they can work on that and we're hoping that Councillor O'Donnell refrains from all puns that he's inclined to make. Try and branch out. <laughs> the, so Councillor Adams has moved the following two ordinances for referral. Ordinances pertaining to campaign spending limits, that's to be referred to committees, uh, the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. Also, the ordinance pertaining to lost parking ticket fine, and that's also to be referred to ordinance. Uh, to refer. Is there a mo the motion's been made and seconded? Who yeah, seconded? I second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, there are no updates. There's no information requests. There's no new business. I'll accept the motion. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye.